Yeah, um, we are super excited to having all of you here today for Freya Homer's uh, lecture. Um, she's she's very, very known for having created um, Shapes and Shader Forge. And uh, yeah, we are, we are just super, exciting to have it, super excited and super grateful for having her here today. Um, but before we are starting, um, yeah, our usual XR Bootcamp introduction that will not take longer than five minutes, I promise. And I hope that everyone has already heard about our open lecture series and um, where we are always um, inviting very well-known figures in the XR space. Uh, like for example, we had Julia Schwartz from Microsoft HoloLens, um, Karen Stolzenberg and Savannah Niles from Magic Leap. And we are going to, um, you, can you can follow us on xrbootcamp.eventbrite.com where you will uh, know firsthand which other um, and future lecturers we will invite. And yeah, as XR Bootcamp, we are offering a lot of VR AR classes from beginner level to advanced level. And all of them are really focused on portfolio project creation and industry level. So um, all our teachers, our industry level teachers are almost celebrities or really celebrities in their field, as we know. And um, at the end of all our classes, you really come out with a, with a result and with a portfolio project. So um, yeah, what we're seeing, I mean, our average course rating is 4.7 out of five and our students are always very happy about our mentorship. Um, you really get a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And um, even if you're already working on, for example, via AR tools for a long time, you really still learn new things from our classes. So it's, um, yeah, as I said, beginner to advanced level. And we are happy that all these companies have already sent, uh, sent their employees to, um, yeah, to learn with us and to, to study with us. So it's not only um, that they have sent their um, people to us, but you can of course also during all our live classes and networking session, yeah, use this opportunity of our courses to also expand your, your network. Um, these are our next courses we have coming up. Um, yeah, on Saturday, we have a rendering optimization class workshop. Um, we have our famous advanced VR interaction class in January happening, taught by um, Dennis Kuhner, the creator of the Hand Physics Lab, which you, which you may um, already know as well. Uh, we have an enterprise AR class in February and a rapid prototyping, XR rapid prototyping class also starting in January. Uh, so I hope, yeah, you can all check that on xrbootcamp.com. And uh, yeah, so I don't want to make you wait so much, but just some more details about the rendering optimization class lecture um, we have coming up on Saturday. Um, what are the advantages of these classes that's really focused on the foundations of rendering optimization. So um, when you're taking this class afterwards, you can you really learn how to solve problems on your own. Um, yeah, you're saving a lot of time because you don't have to research for solutions or ask a lot of people to, to find um, yeah, solutions for the problems you're having with rendering optimization. And you can even bring your own project to class so that you get, um, yeah, personal um, feedback from Vivek Reddy. And um, yeah, Vivek Reddy, he's a virtual production developer and technic uh, technical director at the Lion King and um, Destiny. And uh, yeah, for today, we have an offer for you um, with the code FREYA20 um, that you get a 20% off all these courses. And uh, yeah, but uh, hurry up because it's only valid today. Um, yeah, so, so I hope FREYA is already here with us. Yes, I believe I'm here, assuming this works. Uh, I don't know if it does. Welcome to the stage. Thanks. Uh, all right, uh, should I do some sort of introduction about like who, who the heck I am? Or uh, I presume I should. Uh, uh, hello, uh, uh, I will actually uh, give a short introduction. Hello everyone, I'm also from XR Bootcamp and maybe a little short introduction about Freya. I assume that like uh, over half of the participants already uh, knowing Freya uh, very well, but uh, just a quick introduction for those who have not uh, have a deep um, uh, background knowledge about Freya. Um, Freya is, uh, has previously worked as the co-founder of Neat Corp, the studio behind award-winning VR game Budget Cuts. 
you probably have played or seen uh, in, uh, in the uh, last years. So um, after which Freya built Unity plugins, Shader Forge, and an open source shader editor for Unity, and then released Shapes, a highly rated vector graphics library among the top 10 selling tools in the Unity Asset Store. And nowadays, Freya is an indie developer, educator, math influencer, a Twitch partner with uh, over 22,000 followers uh, who are enjoying Freya's interactive and creative content. So as uh, Rahel mentioned, we are happy to have um, Freya today as one of our guest lecturers. And we would like to have this session as interactive as possible. So maybe a quick uh, short um, uh, like background about how will, will it work. We will take questions from you. Feel free to ask. I know that you already uh, submitted your questions. Uh, since you are at Zoom call, you will be the you will have the chance to use the Q and A button. And uh, please use this button for only questions for chat. You can still chat on the chat uh, uh, bar. So um, we will take the questions one by one. But in addition to that. As Rahel mentioned, we have uh, several advanced classes already, uh, some of them already finished. So our alumni, some of our alumni is here and we have also ongoing classes. So I will also invite them uh, here. So we will also have round table discussion. Maybe they can directly ask questions. And our, some of our trainers, including Vivek and um, Dennis Roger will be here maybe they may also want to ask uh, several questions because shaders and programming is our life uh, as developers. So we would like to make sure that we exchange knowledge as much as possible with the help of Freya's, um, Freya's um, uh, sharing with us. So Freya, stage is yours. Um, I can start uh, maybe uh, uh, some uh, questions, but before that, is there anything that you would like to share with us for those who haven't uh, known much about you? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's kind of hard to just go over what I've done because it's kind of all over the place and it's just very difficult to, <laughs> to explain anything. Um, I, th I feel like you did a good good summary of the whole thing. Uh, so yeah, let's just open up for questions. Perfect. So uh, we are happy to, to, to answer questions one by one. <laughs> so please go ahead and use the Q&A. Uh, I will also invite in the meantime, the, the, the other, um, our lecturers or uh, students. So the first question is from David. Um, is her shapes assets in the Unity store all vector-based? Does it accommodate SVG? Uh, it does not accommodate SVG at all. So I've been like kind of, I've decided that very early on that I don't want this to be in any way related to SVG uh, because SVG, like as far as I know, in the beginning, SVG was never designed to be a real time thing, right? It's supposed to render static, good looking things. Um, so, so what I wanted to do was that I wanted to start out with what would a vector graphics tool in a game engine look like? Because um, I feel like if I start out you know, trying to make it SVG, then people are going to expect me to follow all the standards of SVG and so forth. Uh, so what I wanted to do was just like, you know, try to rethink it like, okay, what would be the best way to do this for game engines? Um, so then that's kind of what I did. I tried to uh, keep it focused on, on game engine specific stuff. Um, and that, that kind of led me to just like kind of ignore SVG as a concept and just, just make my own stuff, right? Um, so, so I haven't added support for it because, um, yeah, because because of that baggage that would sort of come with SVG, all of the expectations people ha would have, and those are like not really like, it's not really the goal of of shapes, right? I want it to be a real time vector graphics thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's yeah, that's that's why I decided to do that. Um, I have one question, quick question. Um... We know that you are really uh, focusing mostly on Unity, but uh, what do you think of other engines or from your perspective, like, of course, uh, Unity is much more C-sharp focused, others are uh, like Unreal is C++. C++. From a programmer perspective, um, how do you uh, actually see um, 
Unity and Unreal use cases for yourself because in some cases Unreal makes more sense, in some cases Unity. So happy to hear about your approach from a programmer perspective, either the difficulty or how you actually um, hold the, all the all the um, ropes in your hand that you can you can actually create your uh, custom uh, maybe framework on top of it. So happy to hear a little bit like Unity Unreal or even any other engine out there in the market, like what is your thoughts about that? Um, I don't have that much experience with other engines. So whatever I'm gonna say, don't like take it all with a grain of salt, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, I have almost only, like, I pretty much only have coding experience in Unity and some other minor engines. Uh, I've never coded in Unreal. In Unreal, I've done 3D art, environment art, lighting, uh, level design, that type of stuff. Uh, because I, I initially, I was not a programmer. So I've been like all over the like game dev spectrum. Um, so the time when I used Unreal Engine, I did mostly art. Uh, but I think like, um, I think it's also important to, when you're considering, you know, one engine over another, you sort of have to look at it on the whole spectrum of what is a game engine, uh, what type of game are you making, and what are all the different aspects of game development that you want to cater it for. Uh, I remember that Unreal Engine, at least historically, and probably still is, um, generally a better engine if you want to do any kind of environment art or something that is supposed to look very pretty and high end. Uh, Unity is sort of catching up with that at this point, uh, you know, trying to do the HDRP stuff and whatnot, which is good, um, but it's not without its flaws, right? Um, so. Yeah, so, so I, I feel like I don't really have a good perspective on that, uh, mm -hmm. except for maybe making shaders in either engine, um, where, you know, in Unreal, they were kind of early on having a, you know, node-based material editor, uh, which made it easy for me as someone who never coded uh, at that point. It made it easy for me to um, do... Uh, to, to, to make shaders in general, because I didn't know how to code things at all. Um, whereas Unity didn't have that. So, so for me, that was just an obvious choice for, okay. um, for making pretty things, which I really like doing. So, yeah. Perfect. So um, <clears throat> one more maybe question regarding your um, personal uh, development on technical skills. Um, beyond engine, uh, maybe even like the development part or developer part. How does the the transformation to become a developer um, happen on your side? Like, um, are you were you always relying on your strong math background, or is it something that you also need to commit a lot to become a strong developer for Unity? Um, it kind of depends on. It's kind of hard to answer that question. Um, usually the way that I function is that I am good at things that I'm interested in and things that I have to learn in order to achieve something. Um, so if we talk about like, um, you know, have I used my mathematics stuff in my earlier work when I didn't do a lot of programming? Not really. I like did some recreational geometry, <laughs> uh, but I never really used it in in like doing art, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In doing art, it was more about the artistic eye and like seeing, you know, what is composition and what is like the how do you deal with lighting and you know contrast and all of those types of things. And that doesn't really involve math in the way that people usually think about math. Um, so that that didn't really crop up until I started doing. Um, you know, more programming, because then it's like, okay, now we need to make a game, I need to add functionality, and adding functionality usually involves a lot of math, because you have a lot of mm -hmm. positions and relationships between objects, uh, and like distance testing and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, so that's when I really started getting into learning all the math you need to, to make games, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Perfect. So uh, I also edit um, our trainers and um, uh, alumni, maybe Anyone who would like to start with a question? Otherwise, I will continue with the questions coming from uh, our uh, like Q&A part. So why are shaders important? What is the use case? Particle, particle effects? Uh, the use case for the... shaders uh, is literally everything you see in a game is made with shaders. Literally everything. Um, the way that you 
set up the way anything looks. It could be anything from your UI. It could be uh, how some how lighting works on some objects. It could be post-processing effects. If you want to add some, I don't know, um, so like tweak the contrast or color values of your game. It could be doing anti-aliasing stuff. Like anything related to graphics is pretty much always done with shaders because that's the purpose of the GPU, right? And any code you run on the GPU is, is pretty much always going to do graphics, right? There are exceptions, but um, so, so generally, the like wielding the force of shaders allow you to like really explore the full spectrum of what is possible in terms of graphics. Um, that sounded way more like a sales pitch than I intended, um, but but yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, you are one of the few people that can really, uh, how could I say, evangelize shaders uh, in in the whole uh, community. So we are uh, happy to hear that from you as well. So uh, Diego actually had one question. Diego, would you like to ask uh, in person or should I should I very quickly? Um, sure. Um, perfect. Uh, can I, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Diego, by the way, Diego is um, uh, our uh, last cohort of hand tracking and advanced VR interactions class alumni. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I don't know what kind of question we are expecting now. So stage is yours, Diego. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, to uh, introduce myself, I, I was part of the first XR Bootcamp as well. Um, I actually am also a patron of you, Freya. Um, I oh, discovered you your so channel uh, with the uh, tools uh, course that you were uploading in Twitch. And I was like, oh, wow, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. I almost finished it, but then work and the school and everything else I didn't finish, but I still plan to. Um, so when it comes to effects and shaders, uh, you you were part of budget cuts, right? Yep. Uh, what was like the biggest challenge when it came to creating a shader like for the portals or something like that? Um, oh yeah, so that's a very like unique type of shader. Um, so I guess the, um, if you're not familiar with budget cuts, um, Probably most of you have played the game Portal by Valve, right? Where you can like open a hole on, on any kind of wall and then you open a hole somewhere else and then you can walk through that hole or you can see through that hole, right? Uh, so it's kind of like you open a portal from one location to another. Um, so that's kind of the base concepts of portals, right? Um, and in budget cuts, we wanted to have a similar type of thing uh, where instead of a portal you place on a wall, you would kind of hold the portal in your hand. Like you would have a literal like circle and a portal around your hand. And we use that for our locomotion system as in a way to move around, right? Um, so it was a teleportation based system where you place a beacon somewhere in the world that opens up a portal in your hand. And that, that portal will show you what it will look like when you have teleported. So you kind of see it from the perspective of the destination, right? So what we have is a situation where we need to render a portal in front of the player or in their hand, right? Uh, outside of the portal, you should see your current location where you're standing. Inside of the portal, you should see what it will look like after you teleport. And the there are a lot of things that make this more complex because of VR. So the, the general setup is that you usually have another set of cameras in the destination location, and then you make those cameras render into the portal, right? Whether that's a render target or you do something else, it's kind of up to you. Um, I can go into the details of how I did it in budget cuts, uh, but, but the gist of it is that you have uh, a double set of cameras. Uh, and then you render that to the portal, and then you make sure that the masking around the portal works well and all of that. Um, and then you, in our case, when you teleport in budget cuts, the portal kind of grows and wraps around your head until your view is like fully enveloped uh, in the destination location, right? Um, so that was kind of the, the basics of the teleportation system. And obviously, this is a pretty dumb idea to do in VR, uh, because in VR, you have one camera per eye, which means that you are rendering a lot of stuff. You are, you know, uh, at least before there were more like VR specific optimizations, you were literally rendering the world twice. Uh, and this is on a very high resolution device uh, that is like, 
it's, it's super high resolution, and usually that makes the performance characteristics really difficult to deal with. Um, and then we decided to make a game where you need to have twice the amount of cameras, which is which was really hard to deal with. So whenever we had to like optimize some scene or whatever, uh, we would make sure that, oh, well, I guess our budget is just cut in half because it needs to work when the portal is open, right? Um, but there are a lot of like optimizations you can do to like try to mitigate all of those costs. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much I should go into details of that, but yeah, I did. Um, I did a lot of things there to to make sure that the rendering is fast, uh, not using an additional render target because having a full screen render target on VR is going to consume tons of memory, right? Um, so so yeah, that was that's a short answer, I guess, <laughs> but that was really challenging. Um, probably because it, it was VR and it, it's something I'd never done before either. Uh, so it's kind of experimental and tricky. And like, there are so many things you don't consider when you're doing something like this uh, that you bump into in terms of game design. Um, so, so for instance, let's say the idea is that when you teleport, the portal is going to like open and then it's going to start enveloping your entire view, right? Uh, so if you look in my camera now, if I expand my hands like this, uh, trying to do it evenly, um, at this point, once it's reached the edge here, your view is fully covered by your destination location, right? Um, but then the question is like, do we wait for the, the whole thing to envelop and go all the way around you in the back, and then you're at the location? Or should that not be the case, right? Um, so, so there are a lot of like decisions like that where we have to figure out, like, OK, so if that's how that works. Um, then we're going to have this delay where if you start teleporting, it's going to envelop your entire field of view. And then behind you, the portal is still closing, but you think that you're done teleporting, right? Um, and then, so, so we were trying to figure out ways to solve this. And, and basically, the, because you kind of have a case where if you start teleporting and then you turn around, you're literally looking backwards, then it's going to start enveloping and then close in on a little circle behind you, uh, which was just gross. And it was really difficult. And we had to wait for the whole thing to, to be over. Um, we ended up solving that by making the center of the portal interpolate toward looking in your direction. Um, so if you're looking to the side and the portal is here, then as it's expanding, it's also going to move in front of you. Um, so then it only has to cover half of your, or only your field of view. Anything behind you doesn't matter. And that allowed us to like make the teleportation feel a bit tighter. We didn't have to like wait for it to close or whatever. Um, and that's just one example of like so many different things we had to like deal with. Um, but that's mostly game design. I don't know how much you care about game design and stuff, but uh, but yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, the, in the chat, they were already asking to go into details. So it is not detailed. At, uh, I mean, it's perfectly detailed at all. So perfect uh, for this explanation. Um, are, you, are you considering the, the next generation of uh, studios or developers uh, more like luckier because of the Quest 2 and new chipset? So I think you will have a a uh, better time in terms of like optimization things. So, because there is one question asking, what was the trick to avoid hal halving your rendering budget? You already mentioned, but uh, is there anything that you used as a trick for rendering optimization of budget cuts? <laughs> um, so the first iteration of the portal and budget cuts was, we literally have two sets of cameras. Um, the destination cameras render into a render target that is full screen, as in basically duplicate your entire screen, have that as a render target, and then we render the destination camera into that. And then in your frame buffer, we render your current location. Um, the destination one is then going to be uh, visible on a shader inside of the portal uh, object, uh, which it works, uh, but it has all sorts of limitations because you're wasting a lot of memory on rendering that render target. Um, and not to mention, if you're rendering your entire screen at the destination, but you're only using this portion, you're wasting pixels because you, you cannot see anything around the portal. And conversely, where you are standing in the real world at your, you know, before teleporting, um, you're wasting pixel inside of the portal because anything behind the portal is not going to be visible, right? Uh, so so the, the first step for me was to try to figure out a way where 
you know, we can make sure that we skip the pixels outside of the portal or skip the pixels inside of the portal, depending on if we're rendering the uh, source of the destination location, right? Um, I keep hitting my microphone. I'm sorry. This is a new mic location, so I'm just going to blame that. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so 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 the way that that we saw that in this case was that we um, we had like there were a few months where we were working from Valve's office in Bellevue. Uh, so we were basically hanging out with them, and we started talking to them about like how they solve things with portals and whatnot. Um, and one thing they talked about was that. Uh, we could use the depth buffer to solve this. Uh, so, so what we ended up doing was that um, the, let's see if I can remember this in the correct order. I first render the uh, inside the portal camera, I think. I forget the order. It doesn't matter. Um, so first I render a mask around the portal itself that is as close to the camera as it can possibly be, as in it sets the depth value to uh, the near plane. Um, and then there's basically a hole in the depth buffer. And then I render the camera as usual. So what that means is that it's going to discard, it's going to early Z out all of the pixels uh, around that portal, right? Which is a much faster way of doing it than actually rendering all of those. Um, and then for the other camera, it's literally the opposite. I flip the depth buffer um, so that it's filled. Um, it's filled inside of the portal, or basically I flip which one is filled and which one is not. So then it only renders inside of that. Um, so what that means is that uh, we now don't need the extra render target. As long as we render first one camera, and then we render some depth buffer hackery to make sure that we can make sure that the depth buffer has a nice state, and then we just render the other camera, and then everything just works fine. Um, so, so that was kind of the, the way that we solved it without using extra render target. Uh, but the... Um, yeah, there, there are like further optimizations that we can do. We were sort of limited by a few things in Unity. Um, like there's this, there's a thing called Cicerect where you can kind of take a camera matrix and kind of cut it so that you only render a very specific region. Um, that would be one way we could optimize it. I forget if we ended up doing something like that. Um, but but yeah, that's there are ways of optimizing it further. But that's what we did in budget cuts at least. Perfect, perfect. I, I actually want to give uh, maybe a few minutes to, to Vivek because he, he will uh, have a workshop this Saturday. Maybe he may have some questions. Uh, as Rahal mentioned, he's, he's the mastermind, rendering mastermind or optimization mastermind behind Lion King Destiny and so, several VRAR titles. Uh, maybe uh, Vivek, can you hear us? Maybe yeah, sure. Like I can hear comment. you comment or uh, ask question yeah hi freya uh, thank you for doing this class it's it's uh, it's really insightful so uh, so yeah we were doing more of a rendering pipeline kind of a class going over in depth of how the pipeline works and uh, breaking down uh, how it differentiates between vr ar and the whole process so that uh, so that before uh, entering into shaders uh, they get uh, an overall view on rendering principles on pipelines so one of the questions i had for you like uh, regarding shaders is uh, like when it comes to shaders, it's uh, like HLSL code running on a GPU and it's vertex shader, fragment shader, right? And at the, at the end of the day, it all ends up there. So I was wondering what are the challenges in porting shaders from one game engine to another game engine uh, from your viewpoint? Like what would be uh, the challenges in doing so? Um, I don't have a lot of experience doing that. So I can't like properly answer that question, um, but I can guess. So, so generally, the the biggest thing about sh like porting shaders between engines uh, is most likely going to be you're going to have to change the way that materials and instance properties are set up, um, and things like you know the way you get the position of the camera might look different uh, depending on what engine you're using. Um, but generally, like all the math and all of that stuff generally stays the same. Uh, so like. Usually, whatever is within the fragment shader and the vertex shader is generally the same. It's mostly all the metadata around that, uh, like what blending mode to use, how to set up the stencil buffer, and how to do all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then obviously, some engines you use a node-based editor, and then some engines you don't. Um, so translating between those can, can be a little tricky. Uh, but otherwise, shaders, shaders are generally surprisingly portable uh, because they're so similar, and they're so like low level and similar between engines. Um, so there's generally mostly just metadata and like inputs and outputs that you need to channel in different ways. 
Uh, okay, that's good to know. It, it's yeah, and following up, uh, like, what do you think of Shader Toy as a as a way where you can get inspired from there and and actually learn from there and and, and uh, you know uh, implement them in game engines? What do you think of that uh, process using Shader Toy as a uh, as an example? Uh, I think Shader Toy is really good in the in the way that it gives you sort of a the playground where it's very easy to iterate quickly. And I I'm like strongly of the mindset that like if you're learning code or anything really, uh, being able to iterate quickly is one of the most important things when you're starting out because you want results quickly. You want to get feedback on like you know what am I doing and what effects does that have on the final output, right? Um, so like in that sense, I think Shader Toy is a great way to like quickly iterate that kind of stuff. On the other hand, um, Shader Toy is not in the context of a game engine. And I am generally kind of wary of learning something outside of the context of the purpose that you're learning it for. Um, so, so if you want to learn how to write shaders for games, I am a strong proponent of you should do that in a game engine. Um, and I would argue that it's better to use a node editor in a game engine than to do it by hand with shader code outside of a game engine. Uh, because doing it in, in, in the situation you're going to use it in like guarantees that you're going to learn things that are useful for your use case, right? If you know making games or shaders for games is your goal, right? Um, because I have seen a few students that you know, they kind of go to Shader Toy and they get excited about all of these like super funky SDF ray tracing fractal shenanigans. Um, and then at the end of the day, they realize that this is not even close to the kinds of shaders you make for games, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even more, the more advanced shaders in games tend to be, uh, you know, oh, maybe it's like a water shader tend to be some of the more complex things or like clouds and stuff like that. Um, but generally you're gonna be doing a lot of shaders that are more related to like VFX, um, related to like vegetation and blending things correctly and post effects and that kind of stuff. Uh, and sometimes I worry that if you wanna learn how to make games, then Shader Toy might not be the best tool to do that. Um, but otherwise, as a playground and as a way to iterate, which is pure shader, it's it's wonderful. It's it's great. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's easy to share your things. You can just try it out in the browser, and it's super cool, right? True, true. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, perfect. So um, one thing to consider, um, maybe um, Vivek, would you like to maybe give a little bit uh, information about the uh, Saturday because. I, for, for us, really, it is important to have different use cases. There are many pitfalls that um, developers can, can uh, have uh, throughout the optimization process. Uh, maybe, Vivek, before, before you uh, leave, maybe you can mention a little bit of use cases that you will mention on Saturday. Sure. So, so what we're doing is rendering optimization principles as a class. We'll be going over. Uh, uh, like why why is it important to optimize and what are what are the users going to gain from optimizations? So in the whole process, we are going to talk about uh, rendering pipelines. Where uh, how, how is the CPU working? What is the command buffer? What are graphics APIs? What is the GPU doing in the process? How is information going in the uh, vertex shader, fragment shader? Like the whole journey or life of a triangle is what we are going to discover, and we are going to uh, understand this not only from a PC point of view, but also from what are limitations in mobile phones, like what is tile-based rendering, and what what is happening in uh, 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 like VR devices. What is the hardware limitations? What is the hardware limitations in augmented reality devices? So going over a wide variety of hardware and also understanding uh, the intricate details about the uh, relationship between hardware, CPU, GPU, and memory. So that's that's what we're going to be covering on this on the uh, rendering optimization principles class on Saturday. Perfect, perfect. Uh, the reason that we are mentioning about that this event is uh, actually part of also a pro event series. So all these events we want to do back to back. And tomorrow we will also have a um, free um, like a, a lecture again from Vivek that you can join us. So uh, perfect, we have a, a lot more questions. So thank you Vivek for your time. Uh, I will go very quickly because I want to make sure that we are at least answering a majority of these questions. So um, if, we, if you already uh, answered, maybe you can also skip as well uh, Freya. Um, uh, but uh, let me start very quickly. So Morris asked, how did you get into shader programming and are there any important resources you used for learning them? 
Um, how did I get into shader programming? I guess it depends on how we define shader programming uh, because it kind of making shaders is something you can do with a node-based interface, which arguably is programming, right? Um, but if, if you mean like coding by hand, um, then I, I guess my, my, like, my initial journey into shaders was in the Unreal Engine, uh, making you know, shaders in the node-based shader editor that they had or still has. Um, and, and that was kind of my first like introduction to like learning how, how do shaders work? What are the underlying principles? So like color and blending and lighting, all of that stuff, right? Um, so I started out in using a node-based editor. Um, then I switched to Unity. And in Unity at the time, there was no node-based editor. And I was kind of like disappointed in that because I really enjoyed playing around with the material editor, um, especially as someone who's a very like visually minded thing. Um, so like I, I have to have visuals and it, it just makes things way more easier for me to learn. Um, so I still think that node-based editors are great for learning. Um, so anyway, then in Unity, I was kind of forced to write shaders by hand and you know just coding them. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of my first foray into coding them. Um, and I, I guess the, I don't know, it was just a bunch of resources online that I was reading. Uh, I was reading Unity's built-in shaders as a reference. Um, so, so mostly just digging around for that kind of stuff. And, you know, having the knowledge of the way that the math and the color stuff and all the blending, like how all of that works, having that baseline of knowledge means that even looking at code, I could like immediately recognize, you know, what matters for what, right? Um, so then I pretty much only had to learn the metadata stuff of like everything around the, you know, the stuff that I'd already done, the node-based editors. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I did it. it. I think it was like, uh, the thing that I used when I was learning it in, in Unity was something, and I think it was like, if you search for like CG books, shaders, Unity, I think you're going to find a wiki that has like some of the pages that were like really fundamental for me to learning how to do shader code in Unity. It's probably a little outdated at this point because uh, it was a long time ago I used that to learn how to do shaders. But <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, and then all of that like sort of led me to then make ShaderForge because I still really liked using node-based editors. Um, so I wanted to make my own tool to do that because I. Again, I, I'm visually minded. I enjoy the visuals of um, having the nodes there and seeing exactly what stage of the shader outputs what color and so forth. Perfect. Uh, I will continue very quickly. Uh, for shapes, is there any is there uh, interoperability with vector graphics? Interoperability with vector graphics apps like Illustrator or uh, nope. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> okay, it's it's so. again, because I want to make it a game engine focused thing, right? Um, so I wanted it to be real-time vector graphics to be used in game engines and SVG and other vector graphics stuff. I don't care about that. Uh, if you want like something that can like import assets from Illustrator or um, SVG files or whatever, there are other assets for that already, but that's not what Shapes is about, right? Perfect. So what were some of the hardest problems to solve when making shapes? Was it mostly performance or visual quality? Um, hardest problem to solve. I, I think this one is really difficult because I feel like shapes started out as very much a passion project because I, <laughs> I, want, I really enjoy uh, making like math animations and I posted a lot of those on Twitter. Um, so, Shapes started out being just whatever I was using for myself in making those animations. Uh, and then it started growing into becoming a thing that would be more generalizable for, um, for using games, right? Um, but I, uh, the, the biggest challenges I think are, I, I think dealing with like explosion of permutations. Um, and what I mean by that is that like, Every time I add a feature, um, let's say I add something like, uh, let's say you can set the thickness of a line, right? A line is a vector graphics primitive you can draw. It just draws a line, right? Um, OK, then you want to set the thickness of this one. Uh, do you set the thickness in meters, or do you set it in pixels? Um, and then immediately we have a branching point, right? Either it's a screen space based one, or it's a world space based thickness, right? Um, and this is like, in, in my head, I'm like, oh, this is great. I should just implement both, right? That would be nice. Um, 
the problem is that every time you add a new feature like this is that anything else I add that has a thickness value, people are now gonna expect there to be both a screen space thickness and a world space thickness. Um, and this is not just for that. You know, If I add a feature to add gradients to one thing, then I need to add gradients to all the other things as well. If I uh, make it so that you can add a dashed line, then people are gonna expect me to make a dashed ring as well, right? Um, and turns out that for, for different shapes, it kind of poses different challenges in order to implement those things, right? Uh, a dashed line is different than a dashed ring because a dashed ring, you probably want the dashes to tile, right? Um, so like there are like all sorts of challenges that, that crop up there. Um, and that is, oh, and that not to mention like Unity has a bunch of different render pipelines now. So I need to, to support, you know, the built-in pipeline, uh, URP, HDRP and so forth. So, so like all of these multiply together in so many combinations and it's very hard for me to keep track of everything um, that I need to do. Um, but so that's something that's a little scary to me. So I'm like, I'm pretty hesitant to add features because I know that Every time I add something, I'm going to have to do that like unilaterally <laughs> across all the different shapes that I have. Um. Perfect. So um, there's a question from Yash. I think uh, um, for beginner level, uh, what kind of recommendations? Our trainers here can also answer uh, by typing to Yash. But do you have any like general recommendation in terms of books or um, content in addition to your of course, your content that you are creating on uh, Twitch, YouTube? Um, no, I was just going to recommend my YouTube video on it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, it's a little old at this point. I'm, I'm actually going to have another shader course in January uh, mm -hmm. that's also going to go up on YouTube. So that's going to be sort of an updated version of my existing shader course. Uh, but yeah, I do have one on my YouTube channel. It's very Unity centric and it's very game engine centric. So if you want to want to learn how to make shaders for games, specifically in Unity, then it's probably a good good place to start. Um, I don't know if I should link my uh, my YouTube. Definitely, um, Definitely on on chat. Yes. Um, let me continue with questions. Mm -hmm. Lots of them piling up. Is there a web based VR environment production tool in market? Uh, VR yeah. environments or uh, web based VR environment pro product production tool. I think uh, Arun means uh, like uh, maybe web XR type of production tool. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, no. I have sort of been I've sort of been outside of the VR space ever since I left Nikart. I haven't done anything like VR related personally. Um, so I, I am not keeping up at all. <laughs> uh, all right. So most of my stuff is not related to VR. Uh, most of my things is like kind of agnostic to um, whatever uh, rendering type you're using. Okay. Uh, Usaid asking, what are the important aspects to learn coding? Uh, a shader, what mathematics category I should learn? Um, so if you are coding shaders, usually when it comes to like the beginner stuff and most shaders actually, uh, a lot of it comes down to manipulating ranges, which sounds a little vague, um, but there are a lot of like ways that you, manipulating ranges is basically manipulating any values across space or time uh, or manipulating a colors and that stuff. So, and, and all of those things kind of tied together uh, using math, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so coding shaders is arguably one of the most math heavy things in game development. Um, whereas like coding, like gameplay code does have math in it, but there's a lot of it that's just like logical structure and relationships between objects. Uh, whereas in shaders, it's very math heavy. Um, but you don't need to know that much math. Um, you need to know how, how colors work. You need to know how vectors work. Um, so like linear algebra is really important. Uh, it would be good to know matrices depending on how far you want to jump into shaders. Um, but the... Yeah, so, so it kind of depends on, on what you want to do with shaders. Once you get to the more complicated stuff, uh, you might have a need for like integrals and stuff like that. Uh, but honestly, it's generally not that complicated of a thing. Uh, but what you really need to do though is that 
you, you don't just need to know how to write the dot product or something. You need to fundamentally know what the dot product is and what you can use it for, um, how it interacts with things like lighting and how you can make lighting using dot products and cross products and whatnot. Um, so, so linear algebra is something that you need to have a really solid grasp of. You, you can't just like sort of know it, but you need to like really know it. Um, then, uh, yeah, so, so for that, I have a recommendation. Go to my YouTube channel. <laughs> I have a, okay. have a math course. It's four parts long, full of assignments uh, and whatnot. And it's like full of linear algebra. Um, so, so if you, I have that on my YouTube. It's it's my best attempt to like teach linear algebra for game developers. So, so if you want to learn that, um, then then feel free to go there. Perfect. So, um, Michael, it's just a related question. Michael is saying that. I understand the fundamentals. I feel like I'm missing some aspects as I can do some shaders like stencils, buffers, matrices, but I have been hitting my head against a brick wall this last two weeks trying to do a good outline shader. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it still the, the right uh, place that we go to your YouTube channel and uh, check uh, or? Uh, no, outline shaders are like, Outline shaders are specifically a very hard case in game development uh, or in rendering in general. Um, so like, I can imagine that a lot of people will have issues doing an outline shader uh, because there are a lot of different ways of doing this. There's no one right answer of doing outline shaders. And pretty much all of them have drawbacks and like trade-offs that you need to balance. Um, and it's genuinely hard. Um, I've been... Like I've been doing freelance work and a lot of the freelance work I did was just doing outline shaders. Um, so like it, it's hard. Um, I, I don't have like a guide on, on my YouTube channel on that specifically. Um, but, but yeah, there, there are people who, uh, so there's someone called Ranya who does like Unity tutorials. So if you search like Ranya Unity tutorial, uh, outline shaders, you will find her stuff on that. Um, so uh, she's done like really good blog posts on how to do outline shaders. Um, but yeah, so so I just want to like, if you are struggling with outline shaders, that is very normal. Like even I would do that <laughs> uh, because like this is complicated. Um, so because again, there are like so many different ways of doing it. You have the like the thing where you uh, take a mesh, invert it and extrude it. Um, that works sort of okay in some cases, uh, but then you're doubling the number of triangles you're doing. Uh, if objects intersect, the outlines are going to look weird. Um, it doesn't handle internal uh, creases. Uh, so if you have like a wall uh, ahead of you and it creases inwards, you're not going to get an outline there. Uh, so if you want to do that type of stuff, uh, you then need to go into doing like a post-process version of outlines. Uh, but then as soon as it's post-process, you now have less control over per object colors. Um, so like if you need to highlight one object with one color of the outline and another one with a different color, like it's it's going to be a lot of work, right? Um, and there is no like one good uh, like solution for that. So it genuinely is hard. Uh, so if you only know the basics and then immediately jump into the uh, like doing outline shaders, you're probably going to have a hard time unless you like follow some sort of tutorial or something that will help you uh, along the way uh, because it is a pretty advanced thing. So I wouldn't I wouldn't beat myself up over it being hard because hey I've been doing this for ten years and I still find it tricky because there are so many edge cases and perfecting outlines is like still being researched. So. Yeah. Perfect. And Manuela, you have one question. Should I ask or would you like to go ahead? Uh, maybe I can ask or. Um, OK, let me ask. Uh, so maybe if you have anything to add, how to learn start with your Unity extension most efficiently for which use cases it is most suitable? Uh, the use case of shapes is basically you want to draw some vector graphics in your world, right? Like maybe you have an RTS game where you want to draw like highlights on the ground around like units. Maybe you want to draw a line or a path from one place to another. Um, yeah, there, there are all sorts of, sorts of like vector graphics things you can do in the world. Uh, or like, oh, maybe you're casting a spell where you want to show some ring or area of effect or, or a cone or something. Uh, all of that stuff is, are things you can do with shapes. Um, you can also sort of do UI and HUD setups. Um, if you look at the trailer for shapes, there are a lot of examples in there of what you can do. Um, it's not a 
UI library though, I need to be careful in saying this because it uh, it doesn't support Unity's native UI. Um, so, but you can still render it as you do with any other mesh renderers. Um, so you can place it in your in your uh, camera and use it as UI or a HUD or whatever. Um, but there's no like button functionality or stuff like that. So yeah. Um, Mark Stillman is also one of our mentors. Uh, he asked. Uh, when getting started with making shaders, what tools would you recommend starting with for people without coding experience? What about for those with coding experience? So is there any different path learning or improving uh, yourself path that you can recommend for no coders or low coding experience or uh, yeah, if you if you don't have coding experience, then absolutely you should use a node based editor. Um, because if you don't know how to code, then you're going to be learning two things at the same time, like not only how to write shaders, but also how to write code. Uh, and doing both of them is going to probably be a little too much, uh, at least if you want to learn efficiently, right? Um, and I mean, the way that I started out learning how to write shaders was to do it with a node-based editor. Um, so again, if you want to do it for games, then use a node-based editor in a game engine. That's like one of the best ways you can do that. Um, and if there are, there are tutorials you're following, that's going to be great. Um, and yeah, you're probably going to get started pretty quickly there. Perfect. Um, Mark, if go ahead, if you have any other question uh, in addition to that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm looking for uh, more questions. Um, so personally, do you prefer coding a shader or create it with node-based interface? I've been a little back and forth on this. I used to use a lot of node-based editors in the past. Um, because then, like again, like I mentioned, I'm very visually minded. Having like everything visually in front of you makes a lot of sense for shaders specifically, uh, because they are literally visual, right? Uh, one of the bigger issues with node-based editors, though, is that there's some functionality that they usually lack. Um, so while they're very intuitive to use, you don't need to do a lot of boilerplate. Uh, everything is relatively quick to set up. Um, they usually lack features instead. Like you can't do for loops. Uh, usually you cannot do like, um, usually you don't have explicit control over um, vert shaders versus frag shaders. Everything usually goes into the fragment shader. Um, usually you don't have control over having multiple passes in your shader. Um, so uh, over time for me, as I've been using shaders more and more and more, um, everything that I used to want to visualize in front of me, I've started to visualize it in my head instead. And it's like, even if I'm writing code, it's sort of, it's hard to explain. When things are getting more and more intuitive, you tend to sort of internally visualize things easily. At least I do. Um, so, so for me, that um, that allowed me to like sort of still make it relatively easily in code. Uh, but in code, I have access to the full feature set. Right? I'm not limited by anything. Um, so, yeah, and, I, and usually just... when like I write shaders, I don't like. I almost never use the built-in features <laughs> in terms of lighting and stuff like that. So I usually just write my own lighting systems. Um, and doing that kind of stuff with a node-based editor tends to get complicated because now you're sort of in like render pipeline territory uh, where you usually want access to like multiple passes and really like hardcore optimized stuff, right? When you're mentioning about the visualization, I remember the very popular show right now of uh, like Queen's Gambit, how uh, she visualized, of course it's for chess, but something that visualization is always like, especially for geometry, it is uh, quite important. So um, there is uh, one uh, still uh, like a maybe add-on question. Um, is there any requirement for, to follow your, your, your uh, lectures or your math related, or is there any, no prerequisite you are you are um, approaching as if everyone is coming with uh, uh, no technical background? Um, it depends on the course. Um, usually, the courses that I do, I presume that people know coding to some extent. You don't have to be super good at code, but being able to read a function, uh, know what it means to set a variable and work with variables and assign things. Uh, that's probably the most important part. Um, I usually, I, uh, I presume that people know how to code. So um, my shader tutorial and my math tutorial, I, I write code in both of those um, because it's, it's usually a very good way to go from theory to practice, right? 
Um, yeah. So I guess that's the that's the one thing. But 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 on the other hand, there's a lot of theory in like especially the shader course uh, where you can still learn a lot even if you don't know how to code. Mm -hmm. I mean, on our class, for example, the workshop, uh, we don't expect so much uh, like deep knowledge on the programming, but at least like a background on either of the engines. Uh, because then profiling and many other things may not be possible. But we are also planning a hands-on um, rendering optimization that we will bring some uh, nightmare scenarios like with low FPS and then try to solve how to make it run on a standalone uh, VR device. So um, my question is, in terms of like the prerequisite on uh, Unity experience, is it uh, the similar, like having a basic understanding of uh, Unity, or do you have any other? Um, oh, in my courses, or yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to follow along, probably. Uh, if you just want to learn the math aspects or the theory theory of it, then it probably doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Utam, uh, he's uh, our one of our students now. How to unlearn? Maybe Utam, do you like, would you like to ask directly? Sure. Uh, uh, hi, Freya. Thank you so much for doing this uh, Q&A session. Uh, I have a similar background uh, in art in the sense like I'm not a programmer uh, by training and I just picked up things by following tutorials on YouTube and reading blog posts and, you know, uh, going to Stack Overflow. So I have a question because I have learned programming through like a bunch of these diverse uh, places. Um, I personally feel that, you know, my coding style is uh, almost like spaghetti code and I want to unlearn that and write uh, more uniform code because I always admire uh, people who are able to write libraries and you know make tools that other people can use. And I try to take some inspiration from them, but when I actually sit down to write code, you know, like some, some reason like my brain cannot really, you know, think in terms of like the architecture or how to plan things around. Uh, maybe it's more sort of like a training uh, that is needed for me. Uh, I would just like to learn from you how uh, I should approach this problem of unlearning um, uh, coding and, you know, uh, start writing like more uniform code? Um, I, I feel like this is one of those things that do come from experience, like you mentioned. Um, I think there are ways you can alleviate that to some extent. Uh, but on the other hand, if you overcorrect for that, then you might instead be in the place where you're like refactoring all the time and everything you're doing is trying to make the perfect code and writing the perfect code is also a bad thing, right? Um, usually you have to mm -hmm. find a balance between just shitting out the worst code possible, but that works immediately uh, versus mm -hmm. trying to create the best, you know, best ever system, right? Um, I guess right. if, if I want to try to give tips, um, I guess the thing you, or the way that I try to approach this is that uh, whenever I'm working in a code base and I start getting a sense that this is, this is just turning into a mess. Um, I can feel the spaghetti nature of all of this. Uh, like say I want to add mm -hmm. a feature and then I realize that, oh God, the way I designed all of this is going to make adding this feature a nightmare. Um, and mm -hmm. I think trying to work on detecting those cases is one of the most important things to avoid that, right? Um, because as soon as you start right. feeling that friction of like, oh God, I'm doing this the wrong way. Um, now is the time to refactor this. Um, and I found that usually refactoring does not take a lot of time. Um, at least not if, mm -hmm. you, if you haven't released anything in production, if you don't have any live code, if it's just you and your project on your computer, then everything, mm -hmm. you can change anything. It doesn't matter. Nothing will break, right? Um, so, right. so, so usually I guess I would like try to stay vigilant of that. Um, and also of course mm -hmm. not to overcorrect, like never try to write perfect code because you have, you have limited time in the world. You have other features to add other bugs, bugs to fix. Right. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. but, but again, it's, it's, I don't know how it feels like this advice is a little vapid because then the next problem is how do I detect when this happens? So I don't really know how useful mm -hmm. it's going to be, but like, <laughs> but I guess that would, <laughs> would be the angle I would take and see if you can like, uh, notice that because, well, I mean, to some extent you have noticed that you are writing spaghetti code already. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so, so maybe going back to some of those existing projects and figuring out like, okay, this is a pain point that made this really difficult and tangled, uh, in which case then, okay, maybe now I need to improve this uh, at least one iteration, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, you kind of like summarize like greatly like my thoughts because I always find myself being overwhelmed um, mm -hmm. and sort of like guilty 
for I think it's pretty good, even though it works. You know, I know it will break, you know, if people say, for example, in VR in specific, like I have seen a lot of bugs when, which weren't intended when people press multiple buttons, right? Especially first time users. Um, and I don't even know like where to start fixing that because, you know, there is a bunch of code that is being um, used to show and have interactions in VR, but, you know, like just because of like uh, maybe a certain way how it's being used, um, you know, things start like breaking and, you know, they start. and. So yeah, that that's has been like my motivation and to um, uh, ask that question. Right. Yeah. I, I think that like every time you do something like that, where you run a play test and you have a user holding VR controllers and you notice that they press every button at all times, uh, then mm -hmm. now that you know that you could go back to your code knowing that with that information and then you can start thinking about like okay is there any way of designing this system that makes this vulnerable to multiple inputs at the same time right um and then you right. can start like refactoring with that in mind like how would you design this ideally um if you knew that people would press every button at all times um and this is actually something we had a problem with in budget cuts um you know, the, the old Vive controllers uh, or the Vive controllers have this like squeeze trigger where you squeeze the handle uh, and they have this touchpad on top of the, uh, the, the controller, right? Uh, in our game, mm -hmm. uh, budget cuts, you throw knives, right? Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. you have people holding the Vive wand uh, and then they're going to throw a knife with that. The problem is that they are pressing down on the side buttons while they're throwing. Many of them press down on the touchpad as well. So whenever someone threw, mm -hmm. they squeeze the entire controller, including two buttons, right? And then they throw the knife. Right. The problem was that, you know, the big button atop, that was our inventory button. So when we started play testing this, people, you know, prepared for their throw and then they threw and then there was nothing in their hand and they wondered what happened, right? Um, but what yeah. happened was that they opened their inventory uh, and that just messed up the whole interaction. Um, so like, so then you have to go back to back to the code and rethink the way that we did this. Do we need to change the inputs? Uh, do we need to um, add some like uh, weird like exceptions to all of these rules, which we ended up doing. Um, so, so like our solution in that case was just kind of like sweep it under the rug, which is probably not great. Uh, <laughs> but our solution was basically like, if the controller is moving quickly and it's behind you, and it seems like you are in a situation where you don't, in, don't intend to open the menu, then we don't open it. Uh, so then we just ignore that input. Um, so we, uh, I, we also changed the bindings as well, um, but like there are all sorts of like stuff that, like that that you need to keep in mind. Um, but like, I, I guess the, the core of it is um, if you notice a problem, uh, do a refactor. Doesn't have to be perfect, but do one iteration of refactoring now that you have new information about how the system is going to be used, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. That has been a very enlightening. I appreciate oh, it. Yeah, cool. I'm glad. Uh, Thanks. One thing that is uh, interesting uh, in the beginning of uh, our um, interactions classes, we uh, maybe Roger, you can also explain like we are teaching UniRx and reactive programming and uh, Utam also uh, exposed to this in the first weeks. So it is a, a little bit different mindset when we look interact with students and we see that um, this having a different mindset is um, on, on uh, reactive programming is quite interesting. And on the other side, there is a ECS uh, system and dots of Unity. Um, what do you think about uh, Unity dots? Uh, like, is it something that you are uh, uh, starting to use or you are exploring or is that um, be like important for the future, especially with all these standalone headsets and everything? I personally, I am deeply uninterested in ECS. <laughs> um, and usually when it comes to like programming paradigms like that, um, like I don't even know what reactive programming is um, because the way that I look at code in general is that it's a means to an end. Um, the What I want to do is I want to make a game. I don't really care how that's going to happen. Uh, but right now, it seems like I have to write code in order to do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the state that DOTS seems to be in, and ECS and Unity in general, um, seems to make my workflow harder 
it doesn't seem to help that much. Um, I think it's different if you work in a team, maybe you have a huge team, maybe you have a networking, you know, multiplayer system where ECS would, you know, greatly benefit the way that you set up your netcode. That might all be true. But for me personally, um, I can already make all the games that I want to make without ECS. And, um, you know, usually the, the biggest gain with ECS is performance. And I, so far, haven't thought of any games that I want to make that are that heavy in terms of performance where I would need to do ECS or whatever. So for me, all of those things kind of add a lot of overhead and extra work that I need to do just to follow some programming paradigm for performance that I don't need. Uh, so, so for me, it's just like, I don't need it as long as I try to keep my code clean. Otherwise, refactor when I start making spaghetti code, um, then usually my projects turn out okay. But then again, I'm one person. I'm an indie developer, and I don't work in teams anymore. Um, so like, my code is made for me and only me. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how much you should trust my words for that. So No, no. I mean, I think for different use cases, it might be different. We are hearing that, of course, like some uh, big studios, game studios are using for their own uh, mobile games. And as you mentioned, most of them are really uh, crowded teams, and it makes sense for them. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, it makes so much sense. So I have to continue with the questions. I know yeah. how much we can uh, have you today, but we have enough I can questions. go on for, for longer, it's fine. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, from Patrick, do you see AI and shaders crossing paths and maybe coming up with smart shading, shading systems that can identify objects and apply the shader at runtime as needed? Um, so far, I haven't seen that much in that area, apart from like um, AI-driven um, like um, upsampling and anti-aliasing. Um, so th that is kind of interesting to me, like if you can do upscaling and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But um, I, I don't know if I've heard of any other AI-related things there. Um, I don't know if those, um, there are some of them. If you, I think it's in, is it in Clip Studio Paint? I think Clip Studio Paint has a, a coloring tool where you can kind of draw a picture and then you can like with AI color that picture in. It's kind of guessing what you're drawing and coloring it based on that. Um, so like there are like people working on stuff like this, but I haven't heard of it being used for games yet. Um, and I can't imagine that it's like ready for real time use just yet. Um, and then on the other hand, as soon as you start going into AI, you also lose control, kind of by nature. Like usually that's the purpose. You don't want to have to do all of these things manually, right? So therefore you add AI. Um, but it also has to be controllable, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, there are like, there are companies that are like, um, like the way that I try to look at it is that I think AI as a content creator in and of itself, I think is a very bad idea. Um, AI as a tool to help creative people achieve their things faster and more easily is a great idea. That's super. Um, so I think there, there are companies that are looking into like having a very procedural workflow. Um, I know that uh, Embark is a studio that is like very focused on procedural stuff and AI things. Uh, they haven't really like released that much yet, uh, but all, a lot of their stuff is like open source and um, yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, but I don't think it's sort of made it into the mainstream yet. Um, so yeah, but, but I imagine it's gonna happen because AI is all the rage uh, for the past like few years, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, Garrett's saying that, uh, thanking you actually for Shader Forge. It is incredible and it made me fall in love with making shaders. I'm sure that there are many people like Garrett who fell in love sh making shaders because of your work. Uh, do you have any tips on wrapping your head around four dimensional math? Four dimensional math? I don't think about four dimensional math that much. Um, so usually the way that I try to work with pretty much everything I do, I usually have a use case. I think like I, I want to make something in a game engine, therefore I need to think about this very specific thing, right? Um, but, but I think there is, um, for some reason, math is one of those areas that I can just recreationally do because I like inherently find it enjoyable, uh, at least if it's related to geometry. Um, but yeah, thinking about four dimensional stuff, usually the way to go is kind of use analogies for other dimensions, right? Um, so if you think about the, usually there's an analogy of like flatlanders, where uh, if you imagine a two-dimensional surface, just a plane, um, like a flat sheet, right? 
uh, and a sphere is passing through this plane, uh, then what, what a two-dimensional creature is going to see is a disk on that, right? It's going to appear like a small disk, and then it's going to grow as the sphere is passing through the plane. And once it's passing through to the other side, it's going to shrink and then disappear, which is going to look really weird to the flatlanders, right? And then we can go up one dimension. OK, now we're here in the real world. Um, we have three dimensions here. Um, you know, uh, there we go, our, our three dimensions, right? Um, so if there's a four-dimensional sphere that's passing into our three-dimensional universe, what will that look like? Well, we can only see a slice of that. We can only see the three-dimensional aspect of it, but not the four-dimensional one. Um, so just like the Flatlanders, we would see a growing sphere, and then that would grow, and then it would shrink and disappear. Um, so, so like you can sort of intuit that kind of stuff um, using analogies like that, kind of like dropping it down one dimension, thinking about how it would work there, and then generalize up another dimension. Um, otherwise, sometimes just looking at the math behind things makes it like pretty easy to see how you can generalize a lot of the equations to any number of dimensions. Uh, but usually that's less intuitive and more like technical. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess, my weird answer to that. Um, anyway, I don't think that much about four-dimensional stuff because um, I have yet to make a four-dimensional game, but maybe one day. Braden is asking, what are some good resources for tools agnostic shaders? In the past, when working in proprietary tools, I have followed Unity tutorials, but had to do quite a bit of adapting problem solving to figure out which parts I needed and which I didn't. I think it's a similar question regarding how to use shaders or porting shaders, but do you have any quick answer for that? Not really, no. Um, I mean, you you have to, like, the, the, like shaders are usually pretty dependent on having data coming in and out of your game engine, right? Um, so the way you pass color information, texture references, and stuff like that is like, it, it just, it is different between different engines. And I don't think there's a quick answer for that. Um, so usually, like, there's no easy way to cross-platform do that. Um, I mean, unless you're like doing things in a game engine that in and of itself is cross-platform, like Unity or Unreal, right? Um, but yeah. Um, there are two optimization questions very quickly. Is there in, in, any way to measure shader performance? And is there any advice on mobile optimization? Uh, and there's one more question. What is the first should you look for when optimizing a shader? Um... This is like a little complicated. It, it is kind of hard to measure that. Usually, um, like the easiest way to measure it is just like compare the frame rate of a thing being on or a thing being off. Um, there are some like, I think it's called NVIDIA NView or something, where you can sort of like do more of an explicit debugging. Uh, sometimes you can see the rendering time of specific shaders or objects and like various profilers. Um, yeah, I don't know. Usually, I use profilers and like just measure the performance of the game um, because it is usually pretty hard to like have an accurate measurement uh, without having it in context. Um, in terms of optimizing in general, um, so there are like generally you want to make sure that you run as little math as possible is like kind of the basics of it. Um, so maybe there are things you can calculate in the vertex shader and then pass to the fragment shader instead of calculating it for every fragment you render. Uh, because especially on mobile, you're generally going to have much, much more pixels than you're going to have vertices in your meshes, right? Um, so if you can calculate something in the vertex shader and then pass it to the fragment shader, that's going to gain you a lot of performance. Um, otherwise, general stuff applies, like as with any other platform. Um, avoid overdraw. Don't have too many layers of things stacked on top of each other, because then it needs to render all of those. Um, and yeah, don't have too many triangles or too many vertices, like kind of general uh, stuff like that. Um, otherwise, there's a um, there's also like an additional thing in shaders where um, shaders don't like branches that vary across the screen. Um, so if you have an if statement where the if can be true or false, and that if statement is true or false in different places on the screen, uh, that's going to slow down your shader. Um, so, so there are certain types of branching that can be expensive. Um, so, so watch out for that, I guess. Um, there's another thing called texture-dependent lookups, where uh, if you're sampling a texture at a coordinate, 
that is based off of another texture, um, then your GPU has to wait for one sampling to finish before it can sample the next one, instead of being able to just run them in parallel, right? Um, yeah, I guess that's the, the basics of the optimizing shaders. Uh, Optolysis is asking, is shader graph in Unity still single pass? Why is it difficult to make it multi-pass? Um, asking about shader graph or shader forge? Shader Forge is mine. Shader Graph is Unity. Yeah, I think he's asking Shader Graph, but uh... okay. Well, in either case, um, why is it difficult? Uh, it's not like I guess it. It's a mostly just a design thing. You need to design a lot of stuff in order to support uh, multi-pass shaders. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I think it's also. I think what Unity is like aiming for, at least right now, when it comes to the node-based editor, is that they want to make it easy to make a shader that has support for all of Unity's features, like lighting and post effects and anti-aliasing and depth effects. Um, so what that means is that when you make a shader in Shader Graph, it is going to generate like 12 passes uh, in order to support all of the Unity features. Um, as soon as you want to do multi-pass shaders, then the question of what should the other passes look like become more complicated. Uh, because now, if you have a multi-pass shader, what pass should the depth pass be based on if you're using shader graph that then need to you know, automatically generate a depth pass? Um, so there are a lot of like design questions that pop up if you want to add support for uh, multi-pass shaders, as in custom multi-pass, where you can you know, have multiple passes in your nodes. right? Um, so, so I think it, it's relatively hard because of that. Um, but if it's just a raw shader where you don't like auto-generate any additional passes or whatever, um, then, then generally that's just kind of one more layer of things you already have, right? Um, but I, I think because of all of the um, automating other passes and whatnot, it becomes way more complicated. Uh, Ehsan is asking, what is your approach to implement graph pass in not based shader editor like shader graph? Um, in a node-based editor, uh, usually it's just a node that you add, and then that's going to add a grab pass. OK, great. So um, can you please talk about mesh rendering, like how it works while playing or editing object? Uh, like editing what objects? Or like what's the situation? Think, yeah, Yash is asking. Maybe uh, he can elaborate. OK, um, let me continue. Um, so we have lots of questions. I mean, I, I just want to. Do you want me to just rapid fire go through this list? or? Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it will be easier because uh, there are a lot of questions. Some of them are already answered. Maybe uh, it will be great. Or okay. if you want uh -huh. to break a little bit, we can also uh, like give let you maybe have a few minutes break. It's up to you. I mean, oh, I don't need a break. Personally, okay, um, or like if people need to go to the bathroom, I guess that would be good, but I'm <laughs> I fine. Think, um, I think they can maybe handle that in the meantime. So let's continue because there are many questions. I just want to make sure that um, let's go for it. And Yeah, um, so if you want, I can just read through and mark them as answered and give short answers to many of these questions. And then I'll do elaborate answers for the ones that seem to deserve one. Yeah, if I think there are also uh, very uh, like repetitive questions as well that you already answered. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Yeah, definitely. It will be um, okay. Let's see. David is asking: Does this mean we need to learn lower level language like C plus plus to accommodate shaders in Unity? No, you do not. Don't learn C plus plus. It's useless if you want to learn how to do shaders in Unity. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, graphics uses a lot of linear algebra. Um, is there any less obvious parts of math you find particularly useful? Um, I guess there are, like in shader programming and in gameplay coding too, you tend to run, in, run into some concepts that uh, are generally not talked about in like regular math classes. Uh, something that I have personally been like evangelizing and talking a lot about as of late um, is the determinant. Um, and 
in, in the case of two two-dimensional vectors, the determinant is sort of the like lost sister of the dot products. And it's wild to me that the determinant is almost never talked about in school, even though it's incredibly useful um, when you're dealing with uh, vectors in so many different cases. Um, so yeah, but I would recommend my math videos on YouTube if you care about the determinant and you want to know what that is. Um, but um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, how do you manage multiple traders while managing performance? Um, the same way you would do anything in any other cases, if you're asking about like VR specifically, uh, you just have to like, if you're doing something for a, a handheld platform or like a standalone VR headset, it's the same stuff as for mobile. Um, it's high resolution. You have like kind of not very performant hardware. Uh, so you just need to take a lot of shortcuts. So it's the same thing as for, as for mobile. Um, is it possible to create AAA style visuals and uh, with like ShaderForge and Unity's Shader Graph? Yes, uh, there's a huge um, there's a huge misconception. I feel like uh, that the quality of your shaders is somehow related to how advanced the technology is. Uh, that is not true. Um, and if you are working on a game and you want to make it look pretty, then you don't need to know the most advanced techniques ever, uh, because a lot of a lot of the time, making something look pretty has more to do with aesthetics than it has to do with like graphics. Um, so, so there's a huge like art component to doing all of these things that's really, really important. Uh, that quite often matters more than you know whether or not you're using a physically based shader, um, because again, the physically based shader is just a tool to achieve a certain type of look, right? Uh, so, if you're going for realism, then sure, it might be useful. If you're not going for realism, then it probably doesn't matter, right? Um, like, what matters in the end is that it should look pretty and communicate what you want to communicate with your aesthetics in your game, right? Um, okay, uh, in VR, what, what pipeline do you suggest to use? Um, oh, like a render pipeline? I don't know, uh, whatever Unity recommends. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. I, I did VR before the render pipelines were a thing, so I can't really answer that. Um, yeah. Um, can we do tools or techniques for debugging shader code? Shader code is like notoriously difficult to debug uh, because like, you don't really have a way to just log a number, uh, but but in general, you you are kind of just like outputting colors. Um, so somewhere in your fragment shader, you just return a color, and then you get some result out of that. And then you have to like um, you have to sort of parse colors and what that means in terms of numbers, right? And in shaders, that means that a value of zero means that it's black, a value of one means that it's white, and then there are grayscale values in between. And then you can have separate those across RGB for different color channels, right? Um, that's kind of the tool you have for debugging. Um, but there are ways of like making that more visual. If if you want to have some sort of gradient somewhere, then you can visualize that gradient in and of itself if you want. Um, yeah, so usually it's just outputting colors um, in, when you're doing stuff in shaders. Um, how do you approach doing shader graphic stuff you don't yet know how to do? Um, is there a book you recommend as a foundation that helps orient beginners in the graphics world? I actually don't really have a book recommendation, which I wish I did. Uh, I should probably look into it because I get, get get these questions a lot of a lot of the time. Um, other than like my shader course on YouTube and the upcoming one on in January, um, but. Um, yeah, usually it involves a lot of like reading like papers, because <laughs> usually there are a lot of papers written for like various new techniques and shaders. Um, and then experimenting, like trying them out, see if you can uh, like implement parts of what they're talking about in the paper, see if you can get that up and running, and then kind of slowly work your way forward like that. Um, if you feel like you don't really know where to even begin uh, with something like that, then I feel like you're probably lacking in some of the fundamentals, um, in which case then working on those would probably be good, right? Um, all right. Uh, uh, do you have any basic best practices for shader coding they feel, feel are often missed among self-taught developers? Um, I, it was a long time ago I had students who were doing shader code. Um, 
No, I, I think the, I, I guess the, it's sort of a meta issue uh, that people sometimes have where uh, people tend to focus on shaders themselves instead of what you want to achieve with the shader. Um, this is kind of a general problem, like no matter what you work with, uh, but if you're working on a game, the goal of your shaders should be to kind of push the aesthetic that you want in the game. Uh, the goal is not to make the shader look as pretty as possible in isolation, uh, or that it should be the most advanced water shader ever. The goal is that it should look good and it should be cohesive and coherent with the, the aesthetics of the world that you're making. Um, so, so quite often, I feel like the, one of the bigger mistakes that people make is that they don't do it in, in context. Um, so if you're learning how to make shaders, don't just make shaders in isolation, make like set it up, set up a scene, you know, um, set up a scene where you have like water and maybe it's like grass shaders and trees and like, I don't know, some particle effects and try to like fit it into a context that, you know, is believable in a video game context. Um, all right. Uh, do you want me to just continue rapid fire <laughs> these questions? Or... Definitely, definitely, no problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you think budget cuts with a double camera rendering would be possible in a mobile device like Quest? Um, probably, but uh, you're going to have to make sacrifices. It's always a trade-off. Uh, if you have an empty scene in Unity, it's definitely going to work. Um, if you have you know, the full-on maximum graphics PC version, no, it's not going to work. So you have to do a lot of trade-offs there. Um, can you recommend URP and Shadograph? Um, Shadograph only works in URP and HDRP so far, as far as I know. Uh, I mean, it works well. Uh, I would use it uh, for like more basic uh, built-in lighting type of stuff. But if I want to do custom shaders, right now custom shaders outside of Shadograph is a nightmare in URP and HDRP. Uh, so I am just being ignorant and happily staying in built-in render pipeline land uh, right now. Um, uh, oh, in, in terms of the uh, like rendering the portal in budget cuts, someone asked if it's possible to render uh, a scene and then duplicate it at, like the way you duplicate a desktop and then offset it for the other eye. Um, no, that is not possible uh, because if you've already rendered it, you have rendered it from the wrong perspective. Um, so if you duplicate it and offset it, um, you're going to have the same perspective for both eyes and you're going to have no depth perception at all. Um, so they have to be slightly different. That being said, there are like internal optimizations that have been done. Um, it used to be called double wide rendering. I, it's not called that anymore, I think. I forget. Um, single pass instance. Anyway, uh, there are like optimizations that people have done where you can kind of like make the shader rendering um, pipeline uh, be way more optimized because you can kind of render things in one pass instead of like two entirely separate ones, right? Because um, like if you're rendering a camera, you need to figure out what is visible within this camera frustum, right? Uh, that's, you know, um, uh, just occlusion calling. If you have two cameras, you're running occlusion calling twice, uh, which is really expensive. But what you can do is that, what if you treat both of your cameras as if it was a single frustum? In that case, you run occlusion calling once, and then you have a little bit of spillover or like some tiny extra meshes being rendered. Uh, but it doesn't matter in the end because now you're um, you save a lot of performance not doing occlusion calling twice, right? Um, okay. Um, what do you think are the most useful nodes when creating a new shader? Uh, usually it doesn't really come down to specific nodes. Um, like it's kind of like asking what is the most useful tool in your toolbox for building something? Um, it depends on what you're building, right? Um, I guess in, in terms of learning, uh, learning how color blending works, uh, Lerp is extremely useful for blending things together when dealing with colors. Um, if you are, um, if you're doing lighting math, then the dot product is one of the most important nodes to uh, know how it works. Um, and like learning how to normalize vectors, what that means, uh, and so forth. I, I guess those are one of the one of the central things when, when making shaders. But, but in general, you're going to be doing a lot of multiplying colors, a lot of interpolating with LERP, uh, a lot of range remapping. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, let's see, already answered about profiling. Um, did you use calling masks uh, for doing the portal and budget cuts? I don't, we, we used calling masks in the game. I don't know if we used it for the portal, I don't remember. Um, 
Um, I have a question on high level thought process that goes into a shader. Um, let's see if there is a force field and a bullet hits that force field, what does the shader need to determine if a pixel needs to change? Um, so, so this is kind of similar to like trying to think of like, what is the bare minimum information needed in order to um, have the information you need to construct the following information for the visuals that you want. Um, so if, there, if you have a shield, like it'll have a shield bubble and you have like bullets coming onto that shield bubble and you want to have some like effect that like explodes on the edges of that bubble, um, then at bare minimum, you need to know uh, where it happened. And if you want to have a ripple effect, you need to know when it happened. Uh, so the shader needs to be aware of, um, you know, where did it impact and when did this happen? Uh, because then in the shader, you can then do things around that point because you know where it is, right? Um, and then you can animate from that because you know when the animation started, which is at the impact time, right? Um, in terms of like how to figure out what you need to do that, that's a difficult question actually. Um, I kind of need to think about that more, I think. Because um, for me, stuff like that comes pretty intuitively now, so I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> um, but I guess you can sort of work backwards. So like, I want something to animate, and I want something to animate from the location where the bullet hit. Then in order to do that, you need to figure out what information you need. What information do you need? Well, you need the position, you need the impact time. From there, you can derive all the rest, right? Um, yeah. Um, does Shader Forge and other node-based stuff do single pass instance? Usually, yes. Um, I also want to write compute shaders. What tool or ID would you recommend? Um, I think Writer is sort of on the forefront of shader highlighting right now when it comes to Unity, at least. Uh, otherwise, I haven't written compute shaders yet, so I can't really talk about that. Um, but hey, if you, again, there are some really good tutorials by Rania. Uh, that you can find on the internet. If you Google for Rania, Unity, um, Compute Shaders, then you're going to find her tutorials. Um, so yeah, you should go there if you want to check out how to do that. Um, otherwise, I personally haven't done it yet. Um, OK, uh, how would you compare Shader Forge and Shader Graph? Uh, Shader Forge is old. Um, I made it. And it's a little outdated at this point, but it supports the built-in pipeline. Um, a lot of people say they like the workflow of that better than the other, you know, shader graph. Um, but personally, I don't know. I don't really use any of them right now, so I guess I can't really talk too much about them. Um, but yeah. Um, otherwise, shader graph is a future-proof alternative because I don't work on shader forge anymore. It's kind of unsupported. So um, yeah, for future future proofing, I would use shader graph. Um, um, I'd be very interested in an overview on how rendering in shapes is handled if we want to use the same approach for rendering custom primitives or extending the shapes functionality. Um, a lot of what shapes has, um, a lot of what shapes is doing is that um, it's heavily GPU based, which means that most of the work is done in the shader. So if you want to draw a line, for instance, what the mesh is, is that it's a single quad mesh, you know, two triangles. And that quad does not change at all in terms of the mesh itself. I don't change the vertex position uh, of the mesh data on the CPU side. All of that happens on the GPU. Uh, so, so I guess the, the first step would be to understand how to um, position vertices dynamically in a shader uh, rather than doing it um, in the mesh data itself uh, using like parameters you pass into the shader. So for me, um, in shapes, for instance, when drawing a line, I pass in the starting point, I pass in the end point, um, and I also pass in like all the other data, like should it be dashed? Uh, what should its dash spacing be? What color should it be? Do we have a start color and an end color, or do we just have a, a single color? Um, are the end caps round or are they square? Or you know stuff like that. All of that's passed into that. Um, apart from that, most of shapes is heavily based on um, signed distance fields where um, signed distance fields are sort of just a fancy way of saying that you're measuring the distance to something. Um, so, so it's kind of like a, a lot of the math for drawing a line, for instance, uh, kind of what you're doing is for every pixel that you are rendering or fragment, you're checking the distance to a line segment. And if you then subtract something from that distance, like say I subtract you know, 0.1, then 0.1 is going to be the radius 
uh, where the boundary is zero. And then you can use that boundary as a mask for rendering, you know, a solid line that, you know, has a radius and looks crisp and good. Um, so a lot of it is based on signed distance fields. Um, so if you search for Inigo Quiles tutorials uh, and like stuff on his website, he has a ton of information about sign distance fields, uh, both in 2D and 3D. Um, so you can look at that stuff if you're interested in, in sign distance fields. Um, but basically, it's mostly checking distance to various things. It can be distance to a line segment. It can be distance to a point in the case of like a disc or a circle. Um, it can be distance to a ring in terms of uh, if you want to draw, you know, a ring with a thickness or if you want to draw a torus and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, uh, does AMD and Intel smart access memory help with game rendering? I have no idea. Um, uh, let's see, is there any special things you need to do for shaders to work in VR or AR versus in a regular 3D game? The biggest difference that happens in AR is, or in VR is that you have stereoscopic vision. Um, you now have two eyes that are looking at something. And there are some effects that get harder to fake when you have stereoscopic vision. Um, so for instance, if you have large scale normal maps, then that is going to be much less convincing because you don't get the parallaxing effect of, you know, seeing it from two different perspectives because normal maps are flat, right? It's just a lighting effect. Um, so, so what tends to happen is that it, it kind of just looks like it's, um, dirty instead of it's actu actually, actually being shaded by light. Right. Um, and then another thing is like anything that's billboarded can sometimes be a little weird. Um, you know, the, the kinds, kinds of like particles that like face the camera, if you have very large particles, uh, that face the camera, then you're now going to have a particle that's facing two cameras, um, where if it's facing both cameras, then it's going to look very fuzzy and it's going to be hard to focus on it. If it faces the center of your head, it's going to look incredibly flat instead. Um, so you have this like weird trade-off where you need to like figure out, you know, how do you deal with the fact that you now have stereo vision and you can now perceive depth in a much more tangible way than you could if you didn't have stereo vision. Um, so that's one of the things you need to like handle um, in VR. Um, all right. Um, could you speak to the difference between screen space shaders and vertex shaders? I've done some screen space image processing, but never vertex shaders. How do I make the jump? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by screen space shaders versus vertex shaders. Um, but I, I imagine by screen space, you mean like um, screen space shaders where you're writing a fragment shader that is kind of a full screen quad, or it's just a 2D thing. Um, so, so I think the, usually when you're making a vertex shader, they're generally very simple. Um, most vertex shaders uh, are just like render a mesh at this position and pass some data to the fragment shader. So like most of the work you're going to do is usually in the fragment shader. Um, shapes is a little bit of an exception because I do a lot of like vertex positioning there. Um, otherwise, you know, you can have stuff like uh, if you have grass that sways in the wind, then you need to make sure that, you know, if these are straws of grass, you want them to only, you know, displace the top vertices and not the bottom, because then they're going to sway like this, which as far as I know, the grass that I have seen does not sway like this in the wind. Um, so, so usually like, uh, it, it, there's, there's not that much of a jump, really. Like you're, instead of doing pixels, you're doing vertices. And instead of setting a color, you're setting a position, right? Uh, so if you already know how to deal with pixels, you're, you should be fine, right? Um, what are the key elements for vegetation shaders? Uh, Anti-aliasing and uh, shading is really important. Um, if you're dealing with uh, shading, then making sure that you have soft normals and shading on any kind of vegetation you have, super important to not make them look as if they are flat. Because usually you have a lot of like uh, flat intersecting shapes uh, that just have, you know, some bushy looking tree top, right? And then you composite a lot of those together and then that makes a tree, right? Um, so if you make a single sheet of tree be shaded as if it's completely flat, as in you have a light source that's shining directly on top of it, and then you start rotating it to be a sharp shadow. If this goes pitch black, that's going to look absolutely terrible. Um, and it's like, for me, that is one of the like, uh, this is going to sound condescending and shitty. And I don't mean it that way because it's fine that people are learning. Uh, but there's a certain type of aesthetic that student projects have. If you're like working with beginner game developers and whatnot, one of the most like, like, 
The thing that always stands out for me when I see student projects that look not great uh, is usually uh, that shading is uh, way too harsh. You have like dark pitch blacks in the middle of trees, which is just entirely not like something you want to have, right? Um, there are various ways of doing that. Uh, you can sort of like fake subsurface scattering. Um, depending on the render pipeline, you can just fake a bunch of things. Like you can tweak the normal of each vertex to point more towards the light source so that they're always like a bit more lit than as if they would be like facing away from something. Um, there are many ways you can like hack that. Um, another thing is if you have like, if you have a ground plane, and you have like straws of grass poking up from that ground, um, the normal directions of the vertices of the grass should not point to the side. Uh, because if it does, you know, if there's lighting coming from above, it's going to be pitch black. And then you have like black streaks in the ground. Um, so one thing that I usually do when it comes to grass, sometimes I just make the normal direction of each vertex point upwards. So then the lighting mass in the, that grass is going to be lit pretty much exactly the same way that the ground is lit, which means that you're going to have like seamless lighting. They're going to be lit the same way, which means that it's going to look really, really nice and blend into the ground, right? Um, so there's all sorts of hacks you can do in order to um, do vegetation shaders. Um, yeah. Um, do you have any examples, uh, examples of things that are often done at the geometry texture level, which are usually or easier solved on a purely shader level? Not really. Usually the, the way that I code shaders is that I tend to do too many things with math that I should be doing with the texture instead. Because more often than not, the math is more expensive than just having a texture that does the same thing. Um, I just really like vector graphics and things that look crisp and clean. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. I don't think I have like a go-to example for that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, like usually the... I guess it sort of ties into VR to some extent because uh, you can't use normal maps to the same extent you could uh, outside of VR. Um, so, so from that perspective, then, then yeah, like having things be geometry instead of using normal maps is really advantageous uh, because then you kind of get the parallaxing and the stereoscopic view for free, right? Um, it's not obviously not for free because you're adding more triangles, but yeah. Um, all right. Um, Let's see, I answered this, right? I think I did, yes. 32 questions left. <laughs> um, let's see, do you want me to continue? Or... Yeah, uh, actually, uh, just to give you uh, a little bit of breathing time, uh, Diego, uh, one of our alumni, wants to ask a question. I just, Go for it. Uh, because I, you are going back to back and it is not easy for you. So we just want to make sure that we uh, you have some small breaks at least. Diego, oh, it's can... fine. This is all I do on stream. I, I answer know, questions. I know, but <laughs> I uh, there are so many different questions, so um, it's really diverse. So Diego, maybe you can um, you can uh, introduce yourself and ask yeah, your question. Um, I think I already introduced myself. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you again so much for doing this Q&A, Rayat. I really appreciate your experience. And speaking of which, uh, delving a little bit deeper into your experience of tool developments, uh, what key elements would you recommend people learning to actually creating Unity tools? Um, uh, the key elements for making Unity tools? Could you be yeah. a little bit more specific? Yeah, like for example, uh, you created ShaderForge, right? So yeah. you had all these uh, rendering system that would create your graphs and all of, all of those things, uh, like the editor drawers, um, the serialization, all of that. Oh, like how to learn editor coding in Unity in yeah, general? Yeah, or... exactly. Oh, um, I, so I don't really know what it looks like today, um, but the way that I went about it was mostly like looking into how Unity made their own things. I would like decompile Unity and then I would look at how they did their UI code. Because um, back when I made Shaderforge, there was like almost no documentation for like editor scripting, uh, but I'm sure there are lots of tutorials out there now. So I think it's a little bit easier than it used to be. Um, but but usually like the, the the important parts is that you need to get serialization very correct. Um, Cause like as soon as you start releasing stuff, if serialization is broken, it's gonna be a nightmare. Uh, so serialization is really important. Uh, depending on what kind of tool it is, performance can be important too. Um, yeah, I don't know, just getting really familiar with their UI systems is probably one of the, the most important things uh, I would say. Other than that, I'm, I guess it would depend on the tool, so. Um any other questions from the from the panelists here? Um, Ayan or Ihan or I know uh, anyone. So we we will 
a little bit let Freya to listen to us as well. Um, if not, maybe we can continue. Let's wait for a few more seconds. Anyone who would like to take? Okay, so uh, let's continue with the questions. If you can, it will be great. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, someone asked, how do you spell Rania? I think Rania's tutorials and stuff has been linked in chat several times now. Um, but I can link it again. Uh, that's searching on our websites for compute chainers. So here you go. Um, all right. Uh, how do you manage complexity with node-based shader editors? Um, the way that I the, the way that I deal with complexity in node-based editors is that I tend to group things into um, like central, like try to section off certain portions that are relatively isolated. Um, so if you're doing a shader, like let's say you're doing a vegetation shader, uh, parts of it might be dealing with a, you know, animation for how it should sway in the wind. Um, another part might be dealing with, you know, uh, like what to, what um, sprite sheet to use or what like what sprite on an atlas to use and doing some UV offsets or whatever. Uh, separating those would be great because they're not related to each other. Um, so like spatially separating out stuff in node-based editor is really helpful. Um, the way that I solved this in Shaderforge was that um, I made a node called set and a node called get. Uh, so you could sort of like cut off a whole portion of your nodes and just move it away, uh, assign all of that to a variable, and then read from that variable somewhere else. Uh, so that kind of helped you like section things off, you know, sort of like the same way you use functions in programming, right? Um, so that's the way that I usually handle uh, complexity there. Um, in Unity's Shader Graph, you can also nest nodes and make nested nodes that are like, uh, you know, turn a group of nodes into a single node. Um, that can also be useful, although sometimes it gets harder to navigate. So you kind of have to do that carefully, I guess. Um, um, we're about to finish 2020. Last decade, a lot happened on graphics programming. Well, like PBR was not a real-time thing 10 years ago. What would you hope to see getting better in shaders and graphics the next decade? What would I want to see get better? Um, I don't know, actually. Uh, I am relatively happy where shaders are right now. I feel like the, the improvements that I'd like to see are not related to technology. I think the, the improvements I want to see are more related to uh, like aesthetics and just like interesting visuals that people can achieve already today. Um, I think that when it comes to like um, realistic stuff um, and like trying to achieve hyper-realism, I'm just not interested in that. Um, I sort of, I, I, I don't know, I, like personally, I just leave that to AAA studios because that seems to be their thing, unfortunately. I feel like AAA studios need to diversify their visuals, but oh well, maybe one day. Um, but yeah, so, so I'm more interested in the aesthetic side of it because I feel like shaders have already come like a massive way already. So, uh, but yeah, obviously like performance gains and whatnot are gonna help like mobile platforms and uh, like VR, especially, especially for like standalone VR. Um, but, but yeah, I, I guess the, one of the things that I'm really interested in in terms of graphics and performance, I really like things that are high frame rate. Um, but right now we're usually limited by our monitors. Uh, but when it comes to like a trade off between, oh, can we make like a little bit more expensive uh, shader or use more realistic shading? Uh, or if we can have a higher screen resolution uh, for me, I'm interested in high frame rates. I think that if you have like a high frame rate monitor, if you've never seen that before, then it's kind of like a whole new experience. <laughs> and you've kind of been living in this haze, um, like blissfully ignorance of how good life is on the other side of 60 Hertz. Um, so, so for me, I'm mostly interested in terms of technology, high refresh rate monitors and GPUs that can handle that, I guess is what I'm interested in. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I'm more interested in the aesthetics side of shaders. Uh, one question regarding that that I'd like to ask maybe very quickly. Um, we, we always, of course, talk about a little bit games, but on the enterprise side, uh, I don't know if you have uh, so, so much like um, uh, experience on that, but would you like to maybe share a little bit of your insights for um, any kind of training scenario or uh, I don't know, like a, maybe a little bit much more like on the different healthcare and other stuff? Are you seeing like usage of shaders is uh, directly implementing the, the the effect of the experience or the impact of the experience, or have you seen 
your students who have used shaders for non-game stuff? Um, have I seen my students use examples? shaders? Um, I don't know. I think the, the thing I've seen mostly for stuff that's non-game stuff is um, if you are doing uh, like art, there are a lot of like art projects that involve just shaders. Um, that's kind of what Shader Toy is really. Um, it's kind of like an art gallery for real-time graphics. Um, so, so I think there's there's a lot of use cases there. The entire like demo scene is sort of a whole thing revolving around this. Um, uh, but aside from that, obviously anything involving graphics, shaders can accelerate that process. Um, if you're making an art program like um, Photoshop or Procreate or Clip Studio Paint, um, doing shaders in all of those is going to massively speed up everything you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like doing anything related to pixels or graphics, you're going to want to do that with shaders. Um, obviously there are like other like computational things you can do. Um, I know there's stuff like uh, folding at home, for instance, is like a like GPU-based computation thing, um, which uh, that's like basically doing charity work with your computational power of your GPU, um, mm. which is a pretty cool initiative as well. Um, yeah. Then you have, I guess, Bitcoin mining, which is not at all charity work, <laughs> um, but that's another use case for GPUs. Um, but, but yeah, so you can obviously use GPUs for stuff that's not graphics. Um, they're kind of, you know, they're a processing unit that is very parallel. Uh, so if you can parallelize your code, then GPUs are going to be able to do that pretty well. Um, if not, then um, then obviously you're probably not going to be able not be using GPUs for that. Um, but I guess that's the most elaborate answer I can give because I don't, I don't work outside of games or art, so um, I don't really know what the enterprise use case would be apart from computation. One thing that in the in the art scene, I, I see like there are some uh, agencies who's using uh, big data, like any kind of big data to reflect, to visualize it on an artistic way. Uh, I see some examples from IBM and other companies. Uh, and as far as I know, they are uh, using shaders as well. Have you seen this kind of like example that your uh, like your shader um, tools are being used for this kind of like connecting with the uh, big data and uh, create something interesting, which is also um, not only artistic, but also meaningful with data. Um, wow, calling art not meaningful, geez. Uh, no, no, I mean, <laughs> meaningful um, with the functional, <laughs> functional. You know what you mean, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, like, because the thing is um, that they, as far as I know, that they are just making this to reflect some kind of like feelings inside with a uh, meaningful data. Maybe this is the correct. Experience. Yeah, yeah, and and like I, I've seen a lot of like really beautiful visualizations of like um, I know there was a website that was visualizing uh, cases of COVID nineteen in Sweden with a three dimensional graph where every city was a node in this graph and you could like rotate it and it looked really neat and everything was kind of scaled by the number of cases depending on uh, you know what city you're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So it's obviously there's a use case for that there. Um, I don't really know that much about it, unfortunately, um, but you can absolutely use a lot of like, especially with WebGL, you can just straight up use shaders in the browser, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, Perfect, so should we continue uh, or? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, okay, so what would be the most useful shader to try and create to learn uh, shaders in general? Um, it's kind of hard in the beginning. Um, I guess, I mean, starting out with a shader that just outputs a color, like how do I make an object that renders at a position and with a color? And then let's say maybe I need to be able to rotate this object and scale it or whatever. And the shader needs to properly respond to that matrix being changed, right? Um, so, so it's like a, a bare minimum shader is always the starting point. Um, and then usually from that point onward, you can kind of start experimenting on your own. Like what happens if I multiply a color with another color? See what happens, you know? Um, and you're going to get interesting results. What if you add them? What if you subtract them? Uh, what if you start working with, you know, maybe you can get the coordinate of the current pixel, and then maybe you can check the distance from that coordinate to some other coordinate. Maybe you can get some interesting effects from that, you know? So, so usually, or at least for me, if you're very motivated and driven, experimenting can be a great way to just figure out how things work. Um, yeah, otherwise, if you're not super motivated, then following a tutorial is going to be a really good way to uh, move forward. Um, 
Does visual scripting based plugins cost more performance wise compared to cutting shaders by hand? Generally, yes, but the difference is not always that big. Um, so in Shaderforge, yes, definitely. Uh, Shaderforge does most things in the fragment shader um, and doesn't offload anything to the vertex shader. And there's no way for you to do that manually. Um, so. So it, like there are cases where node-based editors don't know what you want. Like it doesn't know the use case of the math you're doing, right? Um, Cause it's, it can't, it can't know that. Um, so if you're using a node-based editor, there is no separation of the vertex shader and the fragment shader. So the node-based editor has, has to guess and it's probably gonna veer on the safe side and on the, on the side of looking good. Um, but if you're coding things by hand, you can take shortcuts if you know more about the data you're using, right? Um, so if you have a value that you can interpolate across vertices instead of calculating it in the fragment shader, then interpolating it can be faster, um, which the node-based editor is never gonna guess for you. Um, so usually there is a difference. So if you're doing like mobile shaders or whatever, it might be good. It might be a good idea to uh, do that with code. Um, but you can sort of do both. Um, the the way that I wrote Shaderforge is that I wanted the code that Shaderforge outputs to be readable by humans. Um, so. Um, I, there have been a lot of studios that have used Shaderforge to generate the first version of a shader. And then once they're done with it and they wanna, you know, um, once they're done with it and they wanna optimize it for final release, uh, then they're gonna optimize it by hand. Um, so, so it kind of depends. Uh, Shadergraph's output is not as readable as Shaderforge, uh, which shame on you, Unity. I they thought I told you to make it readable, but mm. um, anyway. Um, Let's see, four-dimensional math. Already answered that one. Optimizing shader code, answering that one. Uh, is there a video you have that talks about Z-depth in particular? No, I don't really have any specific videos like that. Most of my videos are like introductory long form stuff. Um, I have one on math for game development, one for shader coding in Unity, one for tool development in Unity. And those are kind of the, the three major areas that I've been um, making a long form tutorial in. Otherwise, I pretty much never do short tutorials on very, very specific stuff. Um, Let's see, pretty sure I answered that one already. Um, mm -mm -mm. Can you integrate so you can create custom interactive immersive data visualization? I'm not sure where to start with that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a, like somewhere between, um, it's sort of halfway between what Shapes is trying to do and what a UI system would try to do. Because like you want sort of interactable 3D objects, um, but I don't know, you can sort of do it in Unity, but I would probably recommend to do it in a web context because a web, um, like there, there seems to be a lot of data visualization stuff in like uh, WebGL. So I'm sure there's a lot of resources out there on that, but I just personally don't do it. Um, I don't do a lot of that stuff, so. Um, uh, Shape seems amazing, thanks. I'm doing something similar, but with vector graphics. Uh, what do you mean, but with vector graphics? Shapes is vector graphics. How is the optimization done for uh, immediate mode GUI shaders? Um, I don't really officially support immediate mode GUI. Um, so the, um, I guess it depends on what GUI system you're talking about. Uh, but for me, the, um, all the shaders I do have sort of nothing to do with any of the UI systems. Uh, they're all mesh renders that are rendered in the scene and you can sort of use them for UI, but they're not part of the actual UI canvas, right? And in terms of immediate mode rendering, that's literally like, you, you're literally rendering the exact same way as you're doing uh, outside of that. Um, but in terms of immediate mode optimization, that is a difficult topic. And uh, right now it's not very optimized. Right now, everything you draw in shapes in immediate mode is one draw call per object. Um, so, so right now it's not super great, but I'm working on that. Uh, it gets very complicated because of the rendering pipelines. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be improved in the future, hopefully. Um, um, let's see, uh, what are some of the most common effective shader effects to create that AAA feeling that we so desperately seek as indie developers? Uh, I don't know. And uh, question why you desperately seek that AAA look. Maybe it's more need to make your own art style, you know? Um, that's at least, 
how I personally look at it. Um, I, but, but that's a personal thing. I don't know if you're, if you want to achieve like a triple A look, uh, then usually there's a lot of resources for that out there already, because it's kind of the, um, the most common art style, I feel like. Um, so, I mean, if you start using like uh, photogrammetry props, like the stuff that Quixel is working on um, and like hyper-realistic texture maps and whatnot, then you're going to get close. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of like tutorials on that, especially if you're working, working on Unreal Engine. Um, so in there, you can definitely find um, a lot of stuff that like goes into like how to make things more realistic. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to lighting. I think when it comes to AAA styles, a lot of it comes down to properly set up maps, like textures and normal maps and occlusion and stuff like that. Uh, but then again, I don't work that much with hyper-realistic stuff, so don't trust me too much on this. What are the what are the games that you like in terms of art style? Like oh, in terms of art style, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I really like uh, Mirror's Edge was one of the early wow. influential ones. That's one of the rare yeah. AAA games that actually went for their own art style. Nice. Um, so I really like Mirror's Edge. Uh, I really like um, Okami as a PlayStation 2 game, I think. Yeah, I um, and uh, Kentucky Route Zero is a really, really beautiful game. Uh, Made in Unity as well. Uh, love the style of that game. It's kind of similar to uh, Inside, if you played that. Also very stylized. Mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky Route Zero goes even further on stylizing their, uh, the way things look there. It's beautiful. Uh, I really recommend looking at it if you want like a very, very heavily stylized vector graphic style thing. Um, what else? How about Super Hot? Uh, super hot. It's okay. Um, I don't know. It's a bit too simplistic for me. Okay. Um, I feel like Mirror's Edge hit a very nice balance, uh, yeah. whereas Super Hot goes into um, a little too simplistic without having much of an artistic bend to it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the game? There's another game called uh, Unfinished Swan, I think. Oh, that sort yeah. of went all the way there and like having a very unfinished looking landscape. And then you sort of like fill in the way that it looks throughout the game. So they kind of make a point of it in there. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, something that looks a bit more like fancy. Um, Ori and the Blind Forest is a beautiful game. Uh, very artsy, uh, fancy, glowy looking game. Um, that, that looks like... Um, to me, I, I feel like Ori and the Blind Forest looks like the way that Trine tried to make their game look like. Uh, and I feel like Trine failed, and I feel like Ori and the Blind Forest succeeded. Um, and I'm not sure uh, like what the difference there is. I feel like uh, the difference there is that Trine went for more geometry and tried to make things more realistic, whereas Ori and the Blind Forest went for a more um, artistic route of like sort of working more with what it's going to look like in the fi final product and ignore doing things in 3D and doing things in um, 2D uh, in a more impressionistic way. And it worked out really well for them. Uh, it looks super, super beautiful. Um, and then let's see what else. Another art style that I think is really cool. Um, uh, Amanita Design have made a bunch of games that are really cool, uh, like uh, Machinarium. Uh, they released a game recently called Creeks. Uh, they are very like sketchy. Like all of the stuff looks like like literally like, as if it's been sketched on a paper, um, which is also a fun art style. It looks really like personal and down to earth and very like grounded um, and nothing really sticks out. Like nothing has bad lighting because it doesn't really have lighting in the traditional sense of like 3D geometry or whatever. Um, so so Creeks is one of those games that looks really cool. Um, I don't know how long I should go on with various art styles, but those are the ones I could think of right now. Um, oh, Overwatch looks pretty good. That's a AAA example uh, of a more stylized game. Uh, all right. Uh, do, 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 22 questions left. All right. Um, let's see, here's a few questions about coding. Do you have typical structure or layout for your code projects? Uh, do you use a style guide for your code in Unity? Uh, I don't really use any style guides in that sense. I kind of just do what I think is comfortable uh, for me, which I guess that has a style. I just haven't like put words to it or like structured it in a way that I would be able to like easily convey, I think. Um, 
Uh, let's see, what are the main lessons you learned from coding a project like Shadowforge or Shapes? I learned a lot from Shadowforge. Shadowforge is a pile of trash and there are so many things I should have done differently. Um, one of the mistakes I did in, in Shadowforge was that I never made a dependency system. Um, a dependency system is basically like a tree structure where some nodes can depend on having some feature available in the shader, right? Um, the way that I coded Shaderforge was that I had no abstract like syntax tree or dependency tree. Um, it was very naively implemented, and I only had one layer of dependencies. I literally had like a file with a bunch of static variables called like dependencies, and they were just like a long list of bools for like, oh, we depend on having the view vector. That's it. And then there's no like there's no way for me to do that conditionally. Like, what if on some branches I want the want the thing, and on some other branches I don't want it? I, I couldn't support that in Shadowforge because I never had a dependency system that supported that type of code. Um, so like I could never do things like static branching in Shadowforge unless I revamped that whole system, which I ended up never doing. So, um, yeah. Um, um, how do you think about shaders in terms of execution order of operations when you connect new nodes to something in Unreal or Unity's material editor? Um, so the, the order that they're executed in when you're working in a node-based editor is never relevant because there is no signal flow. Um, you only have like a hierarchy of what goes into what calculation. Um, so in some sense, it doesn't matter. Um, it does it in whatever order that makes it possible to calculate the things you want to calculate, right? Um, so, so there, because again, there's no signal flow, so there's no point in even like knowing that information, right? If something depends on something else, it's going to be calculated before that thing, right? Um, or after, yeah. Um, so uh, they also asked that if you wanted, wanted to create effects that modify neighboring pixels, would those modification apply immediately as the shader crawls through pixels in some order or all at once at the end, giving the tick? Um, so on a single shader pass, you can never access the output of that same shader pass. Um, so if you want to access something that was rendered the previous frame, you need to save that somewhere uh, in like some sort of buffer or a texture or whatever. Uh, is Source Tree a good software to keep track of project development? Um, I use Fork, which is a really neat Git UI. Source Tree, I had a lot of authentication issues. I hated it. And um, yeah, Fork is basically Source Tree, but it works and has a dark theme. There you go. Um, does the SDF technique, like sign distance field, fall under conditional branch that could slow down a shader? Nope, there are no branches in that. Uh, you're doing the same type of math and distance checking for every pixel. Um, if you're doing like a sign distance field to a point, you're checking distance to a single point and then maybe subtracting a value or whatever. Um, but that's kind of it. You don't really do anything other than that, right? Um, but there's no branching there because there's no condition to, to check for. Um, would ray marching result in intense processing and cost performance slow down? It can, yeah. Ray marching is usually um, involved in like repeating the same shader code over and over and over again, sometimes like a lot. Um, so ray marching is generally like, it sort of scales based on the number of pixels on screen that is doing the ray marching and how many steps those rays are taking every frame, right? Um, generally, ray marching is very expensive. Generally, uh, you don't use that a lot in games because it's very expensive. Um, but if you're doing stuff in shader toy, then ray marching is ubiquitous. Uh, so, um, uh, is it possible to use mesh rendering component to hide any object and making them visible when the player reach near, touch that particular object? Um, you can use that, yeah. Like if you have a shader that knows the position of the player, uh, you can make like pixel fade out or fade in depending on the distance to the player, right? Uh, so absolutely, you can do uh, that type of stuff. Um, do you have a preference for using gamma or linear color space? Uh, not really. I kind of go for whatever works in my current situation. And um, then I just live with it. Um, because again, I'm a very like output oriented person. Uh, whatever lets me achieve the results and the look that I want is what I'm going to go for. 
um, usually find a linear color space that's setting in Unity. Sometimes it makes it hard to do some types of like additive blending. Um, so usually I don't switch it unless I really, really want to. Um, could you suggest some good sources for learning graphics pipelines in detail? Uh, no, I don't have any good resources for that. I'm sorry. Um, if I want to try making a texture and import it into Unreal, can I start with something as basic as paint.net and try making an entry level texture? Um, you can. It depends on like what you, what kind of art style you want to go for, right? If you want to make like very painterly and blizzard looking like textures, um, I'm thinking about like World of Warcraft or to some extent Overwatch, that like textures that look more painterly, um, then, then yeah, you can start drawing it in any drawing program, right? Um, but if you want to make stuff that's more realistic or more abstract, um, then stuff like Substance uh, Designer. Substance Designer is really good for like procedurally generating patterns and textures for using games. Um, because it can be pretty difficult to make textures on your own. Otherwise, um, just copy stuff from Google, find free texture packs and use those for starting out. Um, but otherwise, like making textures in and of themselves is kind of a creative process that's separate from shaders. Um, so yeah, in that case, it depends on like, do you want to go the artistic where you have to draw them yourself or do you want to go the more technical route of generating them? Or do you want to do some hybrid where you're like layering things on top of each other? Um, kind of depends on what route you want to go for. Uh, let's see, I think I answered that already. Um, would you say that having an intermediate understanding of shaders in general might improve how one designs the game aesthetics wise or maybe even the core gameplay experience? Um, in other words, would shaders be a source of inspiration before becoming the tool to achieve the goal in philosophy? Uh, yes, I think there, there is this view of shaders that a lot of people have where they seem to think that shaders uh, is this kind of like inaccessible, murky thing that they never want to touch ever. Uh, and it seems very complicated and they, they don't want to like have anything to do with that, you know? Uh, I think just getting started and realizing what you can do with it uh, opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, so like, I, I feel like when people make games, you usually work around a lot of issues when you don't know how to do something, right? Um, if you like want to really want to make some sort of shield effect that has those bullet impacts, you know, if you don't know how to make that, then it might you might end up not even trying that in terms of gameplay because you really wanted it to look good, but you don't know how to do that. So you end up not making it at all, right? Um, so, so like having a basic understanding of shaders really help you with like um, at least knowing the possibility space, right? Uh, which can help you, you know, achieve your goals, right? Um, uh, some math is easily to understand, uh, but it's hard to visualize and refine the geometric meaning. For instance, transpose of a matrix and how it changes in space. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to visualize that kind of math and help us understand and learn them? Um, the way that I personally approach these types of things is that I try to think about it as visual as possible, right? Um, so I, um, you know, if you if you want to learn matrices and the way that they work, my go-to is thinking about like how does space transformation work? Because that's kind of what we use matrices for in general. Um, you know, what does it mean to transform from local space to world space or world space to local space, right? Um, so, so usually that's the way that I try to approach it. Um, again, my YouTube has a math series, uh, matrices are covered in there. If you want to learn how matrices work, uh, in terms of like specifically what the transpose means, I'm not sure. Um, the, the way I would do it is kind of like visualize both states and see if you can find a correlation there or Google for it. See if you can find some other person's explanation of what the, uh, what that would do geometrically. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's see, 10 questions. We're, we're doing it. I'm, this is good. I'm answering all of the questions. Um, all right. Do you feel like it's viable to make an indie business from Unity assets or assets like shapes alone, or is it a difficult business? Uh, I'm the wrong person to ask, uh, because I, um, I don't want to sound like full of myself, but, um, I'm, I'm kind of an exceptional case because, uh, Shade of Forge, I was very, very lucky to release Shade of Forge at exactly the time that I did. Um, and the fact that I could, well, of course I'd spend time to write it and work on it and whatever, uh, but the timing of Shade of Forge could not have been better uh, because there was a shader editor in Unity that was getting outdated. 
and it was called Strumpy Shader Editor. And then it kind of like faded out in the background. Um, and then it got updated. People couldn't really use it anymore. Um, and people were really, really hungry for having a shader editor in Unity. Um, and I think because of the fact that I personally wanted that shader editor, it really helped motivate me to write it. Uh, because like I wasn't just writing it for other people. I was writing it for myself because <laughs> I wanted to make shaders with a node-based editor. Um, so, um, so I think ShaderForge is exceptional in the case uh, because of the fact that there was a huge market gap where Unity wasn't that big, but it was growing a lot at the time. Um, so I kind of just hit like a really, really good timing there. Um, in, in terms of uh, shapes, uh, shapes is also exceptional in and of itself because I have a pretty large following on social media now. Um, so while like, I could say that, you know, just put in the hard work and make a really good plugin and you're going to sell a lot. I don't think that's necessarily true because you also need to be able to reach people with that, right? And reaching people is sometimes the hardest part of making, you know, tools or making games or whatever. So, so I'm just really lucky that I, you know, I have a big following on Twitter now where like, you know, most of my followers are either interested in math or they are literally game developers working out there right now. Um, so like, so for me, marketing sort of came very easily because I already had, you know, an audience that were interested in the stuff that I was working on. Um, so, so it's, I don't know what advice I could give in terms of like how to succeed on the asset store. Um, even though I did, obviously, um, but yeah, so, so it's, it's hard. Build an audience, uh, be useful to others. Um, that's about most of the tips I can give. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, um, there's a lot of work that goes into like making sure that your plugin is intuitive and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but honestly, I don't know how much that matters compared to being able to reach people. Uh, it's hard. I don't know. You kind of need both. Um, I just want to connect one more question at the bottom to uh, make sure that you are actually answering the similar question. Are you running your TV? Uh, Huti Tuti is asking, are you running your Twitch and YouTube solely for educational purposes regarding shaders, programming, and game dev? Or are you able to sustain the channels and yourself through them? Thinking about doing the same, but production of quality content is quite expensive. Also, would you consider your channels as your full-time work? Uh, YouTube is making me, I think, $5 per month right now. Uh, so YouTube is a terrible source of income for me. Um, so YouTube, definitely not. Uh, Twitch, I have gotten, uh, it kind of depends on where I am because I kind of like go back and forth and how much I stream. Um, so um, but yeah, Twitch is definitely not even close to being able to sustain like paying rent and food and everything. Um, but I have been running a Patreon at the same time. And so, so Patreon is sort of where I've been like guiding people to go if they really, really want to support me and the, you know, all the work that I do. Um, and Patreon um, has actually reached a point where that can cover uh, what I need to do in order to survive, right? Uh, so, so Patreon really did go to a point where I can sustain the work that I do. Um, and that's partially why I like, you know, I left Neatcorp. Uh, because I knew that I could probably grow my Patreon to a point where it made things more sustainable. Um, so, so yeah, it, it is sustainable for me. But, but again, it's it's hard to compare because, like, again, I have like I've gotten a big following from Shaderforge and then like through budget cuts as well. Um, and like, I'm lucky to have reach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which not everybody does. Again, and like finding that is like one of the most difficult things now. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know, uh, but, but yes, to, to answer your question, um, Patreon and Twitch and the sales that I do on the asset store more than cover, um, my living costs right now. Um, and yeah, it's actually sort of a weird situation I'm in, uh, because shapes sold for a lot of money that I did not expect it to do. Um, so now I sort of need to learn how to do business and how money works. Um, but, but yeah. Perfect. I mean, we are also adding the uh, Patreon link here on chat. So anyone who wants to continue or uh, start contributing to Pat as a patron. Yeah, perfect. So should we uh, finish the last nine? <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. Uh, long time follower of Freya's work. Thanks. Assuming you like my stuff. I don't know if you like my stuff. Maybe you hate following me. 
can you talk about developing a visual language for explaining complex mathematical ideas as uh, succinct animations? They speak to visual thinkers and are so assisting to watch as aha moments. Oh, like talking about my math animations. Um, I mean, I, I sort of approach them the same way that I appro approach like game design and game development. Like I'm making a like a situation or a single scene where I need to like guess what people are thinking, what they already know, what they don't know, uh, and like try to convert that into something visual and intuitive as much as possible. Um, and I usually just use myself as a reference, you know, uh, what do I understand the most or the least when like making an animation? And can I like polish this to make it look a bit more clear? Can I convert this number into something more visual? Um, stuff like that. I don't really know. It's a little vague. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, usually when I'm like doing all sorts of stuff, like, uh, like game development or shader coding and whatnot. Um, I, I usually, I can usually just say that I have a lot of experience doing it and therefore I'm pretty good at it. Uh, the one thing I've never been able to explain is that a, a lot of people tell me that I'm a good educator and I don't know why. <laughs> I, I literally have no idea why um, because I haven't done a lot of like education or whatever. Um, but, but maybe my guess would be that I'm applying the same rules in my head for education that I do in game design. Because um, when you're doing game design, it's all about thinking, what do the player already know? What, what, what is already in their head? Uh, what like preconceptions do they have? Do they already have knowledge about this? Or do they, do you, do they need to get introduced to a new concept? Um, what is central to this thing? Um, how do I you know, set up the colors so that they look at the important things? Can I associate colors with some data so that they feel connected? And like a lot of that work is the same, regardless if it's like game development or education, I guess. Um, one yeah. more comment uh, from Heli. Uh, Freya's voice is so clear and relaxing that I can't wait to check out her tutorials. So oh. <laughs> maybe it is yeah. one of the other factors in addition yeah. to the content, of course. Feel free to, to hop into my tutorials. Um, oh, and my stream. I stream every now and then. I've taken a long break now because we've been moving apartments and whatnot. Uh, but, but yes. Perfect. Uh, all right. Um, do you have experience with augmented reality? Nope, I have no experience with that. I'm sorry. Um, have we tried looking into Blender's malt engine? Uh, no, I haven't done that. I, I'm like very Unity centric right now. So I don't know that much about other engines, unfortunately. Um, let's see, have we played around with Blender's grease pencil and drawing system? Nope, I haven't done any like sculpting yet. Um, oh, 2D drawing system. I don't know how that works. Um, I do some drawing, like like one of my 2020 like goals has been to learn how to draw. Um, so I've been trying to do that. It's something I've been like holding off on learning for a very long time. And it's kind of frustrated me because it, it was like one of the biggest gaps in my skill set. So I really wanted to learn how to do 2D art. Uh, it turns out 2D art is very difficult and you need to practice a lot. Um, 2D art seems to me like one of those things that like, there truly are almost no shortcuts and you have to do it a lot and practice a lot and practice uh, intelligently and practice the right things and not the wrong things. Um, it's incredibly hard because, um, yeah, I feel like like doing 2D art has this incredibly, this gets technical, I guess. So there's this huge branching factor, I feel like in uh, 2D art, there are millions of ways that things can go wrong, like way more than coding. Um, so, so a lot of what it comes down to when you're doing 2D art is that you're sort of traversing this tree of possibilities and you need to like find the ones that are valid. And this is something that is very hard to do with just like thinking through a logical process, you generally have to rely heavily on intuition to navigate this really, really complex space. Um, or at least that's my excuse as for why it takes a long time for me to learn 2D art. Maybe this is all bullshit. I don't know, but this is the way that I look at it, I guess. Um, but, but yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, which game engine programming is shaders is easier? In Unity, we can make stuff in Shader Graph. Um, which one programming shaders from scratch will be easier? Programming shaders from scratch. Um, well, if you want to do shader code, I don't even know how to do that in Unreal. I think it's possible, but I, I think their entire workflow is designed around using their shader editor, the node-based one. 
Um, in Unity, if you're in the built-in pipeline, it's relatively easy. You can just right-click in your project, go new unlit shader, and then you can start experimenting with shaders immediately. Um, that's the way that I do it. That's every time I want to test some code, I just do that in Unity. Um, but then again, I use pretty much only Unity, so um, I'm biased in that way. Uh, how much of your learning process happened with the support of your job, your company versus private research and study? Uh, hard to say. I mean, I learned a lot during my job. And then it's also very difficult to draw the line for what's my job versus private stuff, because that line is getting increasingly blurry. Because um, like, even when I was doing stuff at my company, it was still like a project that started out as a hobby project, and then it kind of like grew from there, right? Um, so like it was, it's it's hard to know <laughs> where to where to draw that line. But like you learn it like wherever you are, whenever you're doing something in games that you're like actively like doing something you're not super familiar with, you're learning, right? Um, so whether that's at work or at home, then you're yeah, you're definitely learning a lot regardless. Um, I have like I think a lot of what I do is both in my spare time and at work. Um, and I'm probably some sort of workaholic uh, or on that type of workaholic spectrum at the very least. Um, Cause I tend to do like, I, I truly enjoy doing all the things I do in terms of game engine stuff uh, and like developing, like doing shaders and game devs. So like I, for me, it never feels like I'm practicing something there. I'm just doing what I enjoy doing. And then I, the learning is sort of like a, um, a secondary thing, I guess. Um, in terms of concentrated learning, um, the things I've had to focus more in order to learn something is uh, like playing the piano or um, drawing, uh, like 2D art, like I mentioned before. That's something that is harder for me to learn. Um, so that's something I've like, I'm trying to learn how to learn that. And it's very hard. I haven't figured it out yet, but hopefully, <laughs> um, hopefully one day. Um, let's see, do you know if there's something like a cookbook, actual book website course that handles common visual effects and shader techniques? Um, there's the book of shaders, I think it's called. People recommend it. I've never read it. So I don't know if it's good, but people say it's good. So um, I would check that out. I don't really know the link, but I'm guessing you can find it if you search. Um, what is the output of view direction node in shader graph? It's incorrect. That's what it is. Uh, it gives you, <laughs> it gives you a view vector, uh, not a view direction. Jeez. Um, no, the, the view direction node gives you the vector pointing from the current fragment being rendered to the camera. Um, but it gives you the full length vector from the point to the camera, right? It doesn't give you a normalized, uh, vector of length one which is why I don't like the fact that it's called direction and not vector, but that's me being pedantic. Um, and yeah, all right, that's all questions. I did it, 110 questions. <laughs> yeah, it is incredible. I mean, this is by far uh, uh, our longest open lecture uh, with two and a half hours, actually less than two and a half hours right now, mm -hmm. and 110 questions answered back to back. Thanks so much for this amazing session, Freya. I think. Uh, I believe that people enjoyed because we still have uh, over 200 people Twitch and Zoom combined. So uh, they stayed that long. So I hope that everyone enjoyed today. Um, and uh, is there anything that you would like to share with us as a last note or as a like a maybe key takeaway in terms of like how we can at least approach to your knowledge level, your maybe mindset of programming shaders Anything you would like to share with us before leaving? Uh, I'm not sure. I feel like I've covered a lot of things <laughs> within all of these questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, something that I talk about a lot is like, um, I, I feel like you. it's important to be honest with yourself uh, when it comes to what you want to learn. Um, I see this a lot being an issue when people are talking about like, um, like maybe people are talking about, you know, do I write my own engine or do I like work in Unity? Uh, and then some people are like, you know, maybe someone is writing their own engine uh, because they really want to make a game. Um, and usually for me, I, I feel like some people are not entirely honest with themselves when it comes to what they actually want to do. Um, so, so, so quite often if someone is writing their own engine, um, I usually point out to them that like, hey, writing your own engine is a huge thing 
that is going to take a massive amount of time. Um, so are you actually doing this because you were a little frustrated by Unity at some point because you couldn't get access to the source code um, and therefore you want to make your own game there? Or are you doing this because you really like writing your own engine? Um, and I think answering that question can be really important in order to like guide where you're going, right? And what you're learning. Um, I think it's good to make sure that you're learning the stuff that's actually relevant for what your goals are. Um, and, and also using that as a test bed for your learning itself. Um, if I wanna learn how to code games, I should not go to some, you know, website where I can learn how to code JavaScript or whatever. I should go to a game engine. Because if you want to learn how to make a game, try it out in context. And then you're you're gonna start like you're gonna accidentally pick things up from the game engine uh, that's like immediately going to be relevant for everything you're gonna do. Um, so so I feel like learning stuff in isolation can be really dangerous because then you you kind of uh, like not only are you isolated from all the things that are relevant outside of the specific code you're doing, uh, but you're also um, you're also at risk of making yourself lose motivation because you're not doing the thing you set out to do, right? If your goal is to make a game, don't do anything else, right? Um, like maybe you don't know how to code, but you should do that in a game engine because then you're in the right spot for doing it. Uh, but if you're going through a long tutorial series on how to use Lua in, on some website, you're not learning how to make games anymore. You're learning how to code Lua, which is not the same thing. Um, so like really like, doing some introspection, looking into what, what it is that you're interested in, what it is that you want to learn, and why you want to learn that and what your goal is, is like really, really important in order to figure out what is you, um, what you should be doing in order to study correctly toward that thing. And that's not only for coding, it applies to everything else as well. Um, like, I mean, if you want to learn 2D art, uh, why do you want to learn 2D art? Uh, do you want to draw like stylized textures for games? Then do that, start drawing textures for games. Uh, and then you're going to start developing the skills needed to do that, right? And then eventually you're going to have assets that look like, you know, Blizzard stylized stuff. Um, or maybe you just want to draw pornography. I don't know. Then do that. You know, if that's the thing that motivates you, then do that. Um, because I think one of the most important things are like harnessing your motivation is like the, the number one thing. If you don't have motivation to do something, your productivity is just going to plummet. Um, so, so I guess that's my my general tip uh, for things. Um, yeah, look into your mind, see what you actually want to do, figure out the the good path forward for yourself. Um, being yeah. exposed to different uh, environments, you said, like, are you meaning like uh, peer programming, debugging, even teaching to someone else? Does it help to your own progress as well? Or, oh, for, like in terms of teaching others? Or... Yeah, teaching others to learn by yourself as, as well. Because I have heard from some of our trainers that they say even teaching motivates you and even uh, strives for more learning more to make mm -hmm. sure that you can answer most of the questions. Is it something similar for you or? Uh, to some extent, yeah. Um, I guess it, it depends on like, it depends on how early I was in my teaching career, I guess. Like very early on, I think that was the case. Like quite often people ask me questions that I hadn't really thought of before. And then it kind of comes out of the blue and you're like, oh, that's actually a really good question. How would you solve this problem, right? Um, but sort of like the more time goes on, you kind of start seeing patterns in what people usually ask, um, especially if you're like, um, you know, doing training sessions for beginners, then, um, then it's more of a useful library you can start building in your head of like, what are the things that people usually don't really quite pick up? And what do I need to improve as a teacher to, you know, better convey, um, you know, how the dot product works, right? Um, like picking up all of those things is usually what I do like these days. Um, but, but then again, I usually do introductory stuff. I don't usually do like super advanced advanced things um, because I feel like, I don't know, like the more advanced you go, the more niche it tends to be and then it becomes less useful for uh, the most amount of people, right? Um, yeah. I mean, on our side, what we are doing is uh, using a platform called Notion to collect all the questions, submitted questions being asked in the class. And then uh, they can see these questions, like in, think of like an FAQ or Wiki. And uh, it's like a cumulative thing that then they can ask much more smarter questions after looking at this um, Notion knowledge base. Uh, mm -hmm. We are using that a lot. So we have a, like a separate um, 
class-based and uh, knowledge-based. So it really works a lot on our side. So um, perfect. Thank you very much, Freya. I think it's already over time. And thanks for this amazing session, answering oh, all these 100. Thank you so uh, much for having me. It was a need to be invited. Yeah, uh, I hope that uh, we can see you in the upcoming months, uh, maybe for specific uh, questions this time. But um, I also would like to uh, tell everyone that please follow Freya on Twitter, Twitch, um, sign up uh, for her um, uh, classes, uh, Patreon page. And we also continue the uh, open lectures as we did with Magic Leap, HoloLens, and uh, Microsoft Research, Freya. And we want to continue that to help to the community to learn VR, AR, a game development, Unity, Unreal. So uh, we are happy to, to be with you today, Freya. And thanks everyone uh, for attending uh, that long session. And hope to see you in the following uh, lecture. And continue to follow uh, Freya and our our channels. Oh, and use the use the code for the next session. Yeah, exactly. There is a code that we are also sharing, uh, maybe on Twitch as well. Freya Twenty, as far as I remember, uh, we will also post. So um, we will be happy to see you in the next open lecture and uh, next workshops. So thanks everyone and have a nice day. See you in the next lecture. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much.